Testing, testing, yeah. So, welcome everyone. Just take a seat. We'll begin in a few seconds. So, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Kevin Johnson. I work as a senior advisor at uh, Nordic Energy Research. And I've also been the program manager of the joint uh, Baltic Nordic Energy Research Program. I'll say a little bit about, more about me later, but uh, first to the practicalities. We will have uh, two different sessions today. One session where we primarily get some results from the projects, and a second session where we would like to get some influence from the, or input from the founders, uh, and also from the researchers and what they would like to have from the founders as well. We have the honor to have two uh, video greetings that we will uh, see, uh, and we will have moderated sessions between each, uh, uh, each uh, with panels between each uh, session. There will also be opportunities for questions from the audience. Uh, we will have one, one question from the moderators after each presentation before we will open the floor uh, during the panel discussions. Uh, and to get the word, you just raise your hand, and then I guess uh, uh, someone here will help you get the microphone. Um, so for the practicalities, we will have lunch at, uh, and help me here, so it's and and Lucia's sons. It's supposed to be pretty close to here. We'll get some help to, to finding the place. Uh, there will be plenty of coffee breaks uh, for you to mingle and talk to each other. Uh, and we also have a pretty long uh, lunch break where you can also go and look at the different posters that we have here as well. Um, you can see that there are some uh, guiding lights here if there is an emergency, so just follow the green lights uh, to get uh, out of the building if, if anything were to happen. Uh, and if you have any questions regarding other practicalities, you can either ask uh, Dide or Gustav in the back, uh, or Marika, that's somewhere here as well. Could you stand up maybe so that people can see you as well? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so just ask them for help if there's any practicalities. Uh, and then for the presenters, we kindly ask you to stick to the timetable. Uh, Martin Hare will try to give you a helping hand. He will give you five minutes, one minute, and <laughs> time to stop. So, um, Hopefully, we'll manage to do, do all this on time as well. And uh, with that, I would like to welcome the first uh, speaker today, Dimitri Skurix, from the Ministry of Economics of the Republic of Latvia. He is the director of the Department of Sustainable Energy Policy, and he will give us a greeting from the Latvian government. So welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my exquisite pleasure and a great personal endeavor to welcome you on this unfortunately rainy, yet still scenic morning here in the capital city of Riga. Today's event, in my personal view, is one of those marvelous endeavors which are actually shaping not only the discourse, but also the future which we are envisaging for ourselves, our children, and our children's children. It is a no man's secret that uh, we find ourselves today in a calamity, and that calamity emanates from a variety of challenges which have manifested themselves over the course of the last, well, three years. The outfall of the pandemic, the Russian war in Ukraine, the macroeconomic turbulence, all by circumventing themselves amongst the context of global warming and climate change, which is real and it is happening. Well, one may not be able to actually feel the results of that process on a day like this, but uh, this summer, the entire continent had gone through an excessive heat wave, and that is just one of the manifestations of the physical realities that bound us in our daily life. And from that perspective, ladies and gentlemen, it is important to understand that with every storm, there comes a possibility for sunshine. And that sunshine is the opportunity or the possibility to reshape the way we are doing things, 
the way we live our lives and the way we prioritize our endeavors and our undertakings. And from that standing point, I do believe that it is pivotal to map those opportunities and to understand how the so-called green transition to a circular and decarbonized economy with a sustainable energy sector may take place in an efficient, transparent and inclusive manner. This is the greatest challenge of our generation. No one can afford to, left, to leave uh, any strata of the socium that surrounds them behind. We're all in this together because, as I said uh, before, we are bound by the physical reality as much as by the economic context. And from that standing point, I do believe it is pivotal to understand that projects which undertake facts-based, analytically sophisticated and robust research deliver the exact thing we all need, both as policymakers, as business people, as professionals, and as citizens of democratic European countries. We need a facts-based approach to shape our future via the correct type of configuration implemented within the political framework through policies and affirmative action on all levels of both economic and legal action. That is pivotal to ensuring the transition in a matter which is de facto sustainable. One may ask, so where are we heading? Quo vadum? And in my personal opinion, the answer is simple. simple. But as per ad astra, through hardship to stars, ladies and gentlemen, and I leave you with that to have a conference which is inclusive intellectually and stimulating from a professional perspective. Thank you very much and enjoy your day. Thank you so much, Dimitris. And for today's uh, second greeting, we would also like to welcome uh, Klaus Skjøde, the CEO of Nordic Energy Research. Welcome. Thank you very much, and welcome from my behalf uh, as well. Um, and also on behalf of Nordic Energy Research, I'm very delighted for, for this opportunity to join forces with so many excellent uh, experts. Uh, do I talk too much? Ah. Ah, you know my name. It doesn't matter. Uh, so Nordic Energy Research is our organization, uh, is organizing this conference together with our dear colleagues from the three ministries of uh, the three Baltic countries, uh, Latvia, Estonia, and, and Lithuania. And we're also organizing, or co-organizing together with, the, with, uh, with these three ministries, this joint research program that this conference is, is part of. So we're very d delighted for that. Just to say a few words about Nordic Energy Research. We are uh, the platform for cooperative energy research and policy development under the auspice of the Nordic uh, Council of Ministers, which is the main forum for official Nordic cooperation, which involves Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, the Faroe Islands, Greenland, and Oland. The three Baltic countries, um, they have become closely tied together with in both formal and informal Nordic cooperation. And today, I, I dare to say that we cooperate in an informal and, and close manner. In the framework of this uh, cooperation, the Nordic and Baltic uh, Prime Minister and Foreign Ministers meet annually to discuss questions um, of regional interest in the so-called NB8 uh, for format, of which the meeting uh, is November 10th in, in Tallinn this year. So, so it's only two weeks from now. This Baltic cooperation uh, with the Nordic Council of Ministers, it actually goes more than 30 years back. The Nordic Council of Ministers opened offices in the capital cities of all three Baltic countries or states as early as in 1991. Um, Nordic Energy Research followed up on, on the Nordic Council of Ministers' initiative on cooperating with the Baltic states in 1999, so it's also more than than 20 years ago, by strengthening the energy cooperation between the Baltics and the Nordics. In 2018, this joint uh, Baltic-Nordic energy research program was initiated with the objective to promote energy research and analyze in the Baltic states and inspire inter-Baltic and Baltic-Nordic cooperation, as well as to promote Baltic-Nordic research area. So today, 
Four years after, we are gathered at this conference, finally. We have had some years with Corona, but now we are gathered here to learn, to share results from the project financed by the Baltic Energy Research Program. You will hear some of them. You can see on the, the posters behind you some of this. So this is only about research, but we are also gathered, gathered here to create long-lasting corporations. The cooperation and mobility between the research environments in the program, as well as the networking at this conference, we had a very delightful uh, dinner yesterday. We have this conference today. We have a, a, a dinner again tonight. I hope that all of you will use that to create friendships, collaboration that would last for many years uh, in the future as well. So today, we, uh, at the conference, we have the opportunity to gain insight into several of the excellent projects. You'll hear some of it. You will see it from the program uh, later on. And it's all project, as we also just heard, that is creating useful and timely common uh, knowledge. Therefore, I hope that this conference will enlighten you on the rapidly evolving landscape of the Baltic Nordic Energy Research Corporation, and that you, all of us, will use those insights as foundation for further research cooperation and developments. So with that, I just want to say thank you for letting Nordic Energy Research being part of the organization of, of this conference, as well as the joint research program. So welcome. Thank you, Klaus. Good. So with that, I would like to introduce myself uh, again. My name is uh, Kevin Johnson. I've been working at Nordic Energy Research for about six years. And I have been a part of this program since the first beginning. Um, so what I wanted to do is to give a brief introduction to the program. Most of you are in some way familiar with it. Some of you have been here from the start. Uh, others have come into this cooperation more recently. And um, to sum it up, it's a, it's a joint, jointly funded research cooperation funded by Nordic Energy Research and the three ministries in the Baltic countries with responsibility for the energy sector. To give you some uh, highlights, and as uh, Klaus mentioned, the overall aim of the program is to promote energy research and analysis in the Baltic states and inspire intra-Baltic and Baltic-Nordic cooperation by using the funding that we have available. And over these four years, that has been approximately 2 million euros. And with these funds, we managed to fund nine uh, research projects. You can see a lot of them on the posters on the wall. We have managed to finance four mobility projects. And as you can see, we've also managed to uh, activate or include over 100 different researchers uh, in these different projects. So what I thought I could give that, uh, uh, since I've been here since the start, is some of the background for the program. Because, at least as I was told by our former director, this idea started already back in 2016 at a conference in Kaunas, where one of the, where the at that time, uh, Ministry of Energy, uh, in his speech to this conference, mentioned that it would be good to have a more formalized cooperation. Um, and if you know my former boss, you know that he sometimes uh, hears what he would like to hear, so I'm not, not completely sure that that was exactly what was said. But at least that was the story that I was told and I've been, I've been working uh, with. And based on that thought that we needed a more formalized cooperation, um, we at Nordic Energy Research initiated the, uh, um, a steering group for producing what was later known to be the Baltic Energy Technology Scenarios Report. Uh, and for me personally, that was one of the first like, large projects that I had the full responsibility for. And in that steering group, we actually had the first meeting in this building uh, in 2017, in one of the meeting rooms uh, in the first floor. Uh, and after that meeting, the Latvian minister, or the deputy minister, uh, sent us a formal email where he asked if this steering group could also work as a steering group for a discussion on having a formalized memorandum of, uh, of uh, understanding uh, regarding a research cooperation, as well as producing this specific report. I'm not sure if you, you managed to see it, but there are some copies of that report there out there as well, if you would like to take one uh, with you back. And then, during a couple of years, it 
from 2017 to 2018, we had a long and inclusive uh, dialogue with the Baltic states where we managed to produce a memorandum of understanding that we then uh, had the last signature of on Friday the 26th in October in 2018 and we could begin the formal cooperation. And for Nordic Energy Research uh, point of view, this was also the first uh, common, commonly financed research project that we had done in, uh, done in years. So this was pretty new for us as well and I know that for at least for some of the ministries, uh, funding research was also an activity that they haven't been used to as well. So that we did some groundbreaking new things when we developed this uh, program. So the aims of the program is uh, divided in three. We have three aims. We would like to promote the intra-Baltic and Baltic-Nordic uh, cooperation. But we also want to have a Baltic-Nordic Doctor of Philosophy collaboration that has developed into the, uh, and also an exchange of energy researchers. And so th these last actions have developed into the mobility projects, while the first section have developed into the uh, research projects we have financed throughout the uh, four years. We also have a thematic scope, so the project should work within decarbonization of the transport sector, it should be within the energy efficiency in buildings and industry, it could be energy system analysis, or it could be related to the challenges and opportunities of regional electricity grids. And as uh, mentioned, we uh, have a funding of about 2 million uh, euros. We usually get about five times as many applications that we have the ability to fund through the program. And again, we have managed to activate over 100 individual different researchers uh, through these projects. And if you look at the, um, how the funding is allocated, you can see that most of the funding have been used in the research projects. And then we also used a substantial amount on the uh, mobility and PhD projects. And then the project, then the, uh, the board have also commissioned some special reports. I brought three copies, uh, one, or one copy of each, so you can look in it uh, in the outside, but they're also available on the uh, internet as well. And uh, to just take you quickly through the projects, because we will uh, get some presentations from from most of them, for some of them, but some of them will also be on the posters and you can also read on, of them online. So for the first round of research projects, we financed uh, three projects. We financed the project that we call FASTEN, Fast, Flexible and Secure Decarbonization of the Baltic States. You will hear Tommy tell you more about those results uh, later today. But we also had a project called Integrating Energy Sufficiency into Modeling or Sustainable Energy Scenarios and Michael here can probably tell you more about that if you you would like to get the details there. And we also had a project called Knowledge Sharing in the Near Zero Emission Buildings in the Nordic Baltic region as well. From the second round of projects, you will get to hear from two of the projects. You will get to hear from the Baltub project, integrating the Baltic Sea countries via offshore energy hubs from Hadi. And then you will uh, also hear about the techno-economic performance and feasibility study of the fifth generation district heating and cooling technology using agent-based modeling and GIS from <laughs> Anna Volkova here in a couple of minutes as well. And then we also have the project called Impacts of Ambitions Energy Policy Pathways that builds on the FASTEN projects and Tommy might give you some, some results from there as well in his presentation. Then we have some new projects that just started up in 2022. Uh, where you will get to hear from the Nuance project, the role of hard-to-reach energy users in reaching Baltic and Nordic climate uh, targets uh, and multidisciplinary analysis from Andra Blumberger uh, today. But we also have the projects uh, Next Ugrid and the project Waste Hidden Energy Systems. For the PhD student and research mobility projects, we have four different projects, and you will get to hear from the project that we call uh, Remonet Bioenergy uh, from uh, Ernst uh, later. But we also have a project called the COSPACT, looking into the AC-DC transmission grid. We have a project looking into uh, thermochemical conversion of biomass. And we have the CDS project looking into uh, the EV effects, EV's effects on the, uh, on, the, on the power system as well. So, I, in my view, the researcher here is better to explain the content of these presentations 
and looking forward to hear everything that they have to tell. So uh, thank you for the attention and uh, yeah. And with that, we would like to welcome uh, the first presentation. So Anna, would you like to come up here? Anna is uh, from Latvia. She defended her PhD at uh, Riga Technical University in 2008. And for more than uh, 30 years, she has been working with district heating. Uh, and she is now the head of smart district heating systems and integrated assessment analysis of greenhouse gas emissions at uh, Taltec. Uh, beside her work, we've learned that she likes to travel with her family uh, and also sing in Italian Russian folk choir, uh, Sudaruski, <laughs> Sudaruski, with an alto voice. So please welcome and let's hear a bit about the fifth generation district heating system. Thank you, thank you very much for a great introduction. And in the very beginning, I would like to tell that it is a real pleasure and honor for me to participate in this great uh, conference and thank you for organization Nordic Energy Research and um, actually as, I, as uh, Kevin told so my, my research career has been started uh, in Riga Technical University and I'm happy to see my colleagues no, there are no former colleagues colleagues for all life life and uh, now I work during the last 13 years in Tal Tech and Tal University of Technology and uh, actually I participated in five projects of Nordic Energy Research uh, on, on, in this project, in this program, but I will have another one presentation in the second session and we'll stop on it more. Uh, but now I would like to share results, some, some results of our uh, agent G's Few generation district heating and cooling project that actually will be finalized after some months. And uh, it is a project regarding novel technology, fifth, uh, fifth generation district heating and cooling. And there are wide discussion regarding this topic and this future in the Baltic states and in, in Europe. And uh, our main task were to, to investigate, to study the potential in the Baltic states and to provide this scientific basis for our ministries too, for the future. Yes. So very briefly about what fifth generation district heating means, because I suppose that not all uh, people are experts in district heating here. And uh, actually, uh, the main idea that it is district heating where ultra low uh, temperature heat is transferred uh, to buildings, and in each building there are individual heat pumps uh, that can increase temperature for heating purposes or decrease uh, temperature for cooling purposes. Uh, there are very wide discussion about correctness of this term, uh, including discussions among the researchers who were authors of uh, uh, Generations idea for district heating and they don't like, frankly speaking, this title. In the very beginning we did not like it too and I'm not sure that we like it still. So uh, actually uh, maybe more correct title would be ambient temperature uh, district heating. And it is rather niche solution that can be used in very specific conditions but we decided to study, to be prepared for future to study this potential in the Baltic states. And uh, we had, uh, have, still have very, really great consortium. And actually this idea came from Dalarna University. They were initiators <laughs> and they uh, invited me and decided that it would be more, um, uh, it would be better if uh, Taltec would start uh, coordinating it. And actually Tal uh, University of Technology are coordinators. Then uh, our partners, Dalarna University, Riga Technical University, and Lithuanian Energy Institute. I'm, I'm very happy that uh, most of our participants from each of these partner uh, research organizations are here. 
and I hope we will together stand near our poster and present it and discuss it with you. Uh, we, uh, the most active this part were during pandemic time and actually we had around 25 or even more already online meetings. Uh, we had two meetings in person due to other conferences where we had possibility to meet and uh, some uh, meetings with some of partners. And for, and for sure we had yesterday great meeting today, so maybe more, I should add more. And uh, during this project, uh, we had presented already our results, some part, partly results during two conferences in Connect Riga and in Olberg Smart Energy System Conference, the main conference for district heating. And we uh, have planned to presentation, one will be after, after two weeks in Paphos and uh, in spring, I think, yes, in Japan. We have already published two papers and they are publicly available in energy reports and in uh, uh, renewable and sustainable energy reviews related to this project and uh, one more accepted about business models uh, for fifth generation district heating will be published in the nearest future and one more planned. So rather productive from, from research side during these two years. And duration of the project, as I understand, is all other projects, it is two years. And uh, Kevin mentioned these four uh, main fields of interest for, for this program, and three of it were covered by this project. It is energy efficiency in buildings, energy system analysis, and challenges and opportunities for regional electricity grids, because in this case, uh, power to heat uh, solution were rather important. And we had content related, for sure it were more work packages, but content related uh, for uh, work packages. And first work packages about uh, fifth generation district heating and cooling aging database development. We were responsible for it, Taltech. Then technical performance analysis of fifth generation district heating and cooling in the Baltic and Nordic regions led by Dalarna University. Business models of this solution led by Riga Technical University and barriers and drivers of this technical solution. Uh, and it was led by uh, Lithuanian Energy Institute. I just tried to find these faces here, <laughs> our people who worked with it. And we have already outcomes. It is actually uh, during previous uh, project, specific project about heat pump potential in the Baltic states, Taltech has created uh, uh, this uh, online uh, uh, arts GIS uh, map with uh, uh, waste heat sources for our three Baltic states, including uh, so low temperature and high temperature heat uh, sources, waste heat sources, industrial waste heat, uh, lakes, rivers, uh, uh, sea water, sewage, uh, uh, sewage plants and so on. But during this project, we have added three new layers, and actually, it is not so traditional heat sources like electric transformers. Uh, and retail stores and data centers. And uh, based on literature review, we have understood that uh, these are one of the most uh, um, investigated and interesting agents for this fifth generation district heating and cooling. And we tried to collect information from each country, from each Baltic country, and edit it to map. And here is link. I understand this presentation will be available online, so you can use and for some preliminary research and uh, uh, for some planning purposes and so on. So it is already available tool that can be used. So speaking about uh, Lithuanian Energy Institute tasks, so they more um, were focused on barriers and drivers. There are rather many of them. And we had long discussions and uh, interviews with experts and so on. But actually, I would mention as a main barrier for this um, uh, technical solution and for many other uh, non-fuel district heating solution that actually the main barrier now would be in our Baltic states existing district heating system, uh, very well developed, biomass based in many cases and in the same time in some of our countries still 
rather high share of non-renewable electricity. So in this case, when you have some something like power to heat uh, solution, it would be a real barrier for implementation of such technology. But at the same time, we have drivers at very ambitious climate change targets and ambitious energy transition targets and even higher rejection of uh, natural gas and so on. So, but these results already have been published and you can uh, look at later. Uh, as uh, always, Baltic states, they like to compare each other and compare where is better and so on. And that's why we used multi-criteria analysis to compare potential of uh, uh, fifth generation district heating and cooling in all our three countries. And there are many criteria, including share of renewable energy, uh, renewable electricity, CO2 emission factor for electricity now and planned, and maximum minimum heat tariffs and uh, share of new buildings. And uh, one more uh, group of uh, criteria were related with this map that I have uh, shown. So actually based on this map, uh, we have uh, analyzed uh, excess heat uh, potential from shopping malls, excess heat potential from electric transformers and data centers, uh, and use it as criteria for comparing. So we have compared three countries um, using both equal weights and prioritized weights. And here winner is Lithuania, so if we take uh, prioritized waste, weights and criteria that were selected by, by us, by researchers, so actually taking in, into account open heating market and the stage with renewable heating, renewable electricity, uh, so uh, the closest to ideal solution, the closest to ideal situation when fifth generation district heating and cooling can be implemented, the situation is in Lithuania. Uh, so uh, another one outcome uh, and uh, Riga Technical University was responsible for it and we have paper for it too so actually we tried to analyze uh, business models by game theory for this type of solution and there were three uh, types of business model in the first uh, uh, scenario owner of this fifth generation district heating and cooling would be district heating operator in the second one it would be real estate owner and in the third one energy community and uh, the lowest uh, heating cost would be in the second scenario but actually this analysis has shown that in the conditions of current legislation, current situation when district heating sector is highly regulated, uh, fifth generation district heating would not be able to compete with uh, current district heating and uh, th something should be changed and analyzed to provide possibility for novel, novel heat supply solutions to, to, to be developed and implemented. And uh, actually, uh, another type of research result, uh, and uh, Dalana University was respons responsible for it, so techno-economical analysis of fifth generation district heating system has been done, cooling was not included, if I'm not mistaken, yes. Actually, detailed thermohydraulic model for small district uh, has been created, and what is interesting that we have used data for uh, district uh, from Tallinn, from uh, new district with new buildings with floor heating, but uh, data regarding heat source was taken from Riga, from data center, and just this way, and uh, Sweden researchers has made, uh, has made this analysis, as well, transit model of substation uh, for the fifth generation district heat and cooling has been created, and network model included, and these uh, results will be published as well, and there are many results regarding flows and temperatures, but here's example of COP for these individual heat pumps, uh, how it it will be increased based on uh, outdoor temperature. And, uh, but actually, as I understand, it will be published maybe in the, in the beginning of next year. Yes.
the main author <laughs> told, told yes. So actually, steel project is not finalized, and at the moment, uh, uh, we plan to prepare final project report. We plan to partly uh, prepare recommendations for ministries, and I will mention it during my next presentation because I had to split a little bit. Fact sheet published for uh, it is uh, in preparation for public, and we plan a final workshop for our observers, for stakeholders, and uh, to present uh, to present our uh, results. So. Thank you for your attention. Please, questions. So, uh, thank you, Anna. So, we have prepared one question for you, uh, and we would like to know what is your outlook for the heating situation in the Baltics this and the coming winter, and how can your situation, having in mind the geopolitical crisis ah. and uh, everything, and how is your research supporting uh, this? This research, yeah, <laughs> and uh, actually, uh, uh, current situation uh, for sure. Um, I would tell that if we take all our three countries, uh, my current country where I live, Estonia, was um, mostly prepared for it, and not because of this type of solution. Because if we during other analysis, this power to heat. Uh, solutions are implemented. We have in Estonia too. We have uh, more individual heat heat pumps and so on. But uh, for district heating, uh, we have the highest share of biomass for district heating in uh, Estonia, and we don't have. Uh, not only one, I think we have very small district heating network where base load is covered by gas boilers. We have, uh, during last two years, almost all last uh, gas boilers has been, have been replaced by uh, biomass uh, boilers. But if uh, I take this situation, yes, so this uh, political situation, led to, to, to the situation that uh, uh, even more biomass uh, boilers have been installed. And for this type of solution, for large heat pumps, for solar heating, and for other non-fuel technologies, a uh, high share of biomass boilers and very well developed high temperature district heating is real barrier. It means that, okay, we have uh, this, uh, we are much closer to carbon neutrality, but uh, it means that uh, we, when you have absolutely new installed uh, uh, efficient uh, biomass boilers, uh, I don't believe it will be replaced by, by fifth uh, generation district heating. Uh, but uh, still, in some places, in new, uh, in new districts, uh, where, where maybe not so close for, to existing district heating and so on, it can be a solution. And we, uh, during this research, we have met with uh, different stakeholders, with uh, real estate, with uh, some, I don't know, for example, the Saddam Quartal and Ulemiste Quartal in Estonia and other, I don't remember, with Riga, yes, we had uh, someone too. So they are interested, they start thinking about it. But question is when we will be implemented. I'm not sure that I and answered, but because it is rather, it is rather because from one side we are much closer. We have, due to this active biomass energy supporting policy in Estonia, we have uh, uh, only 20. 20% of natural gas and district heating uh, in share, and it is very uh, changing situation. Now it is very positive. But from the other side, we just have uh, uh, constructed this barrier to non fuel technologies at the moment. Yeah, thank you. So thank you for the presentation, Anna. We will move on to the uh, next uh, speaker here. Uh, let me welcome uh, Mr. Kuduvere, who has been working with uh, small and large scale energy system models in Teltec uh, and holds a master's degree in electrical power engineering. 
Uh, you're especially interested in the integration of intermittent uh, renewables coupled with flexibility uh, in the energy system. And at your spare time, you like to enjoy traveling and being in nature. So welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very happy to be here and, and I'm very happy to provide results of, of our project. And uh, I think this, this topic is, is more timely th than ever. I think the, the political, uh, economic uh, and climatic background has been highlighted already today quite well. And we are uh, especially investigating in an, an aspect which can uh, which is based on, on more integrated cooperation between countries in, in the Baltic Sea area. And I think this is, this is the time when, where we need cooperation more than ever. So I, I think the timing of this project is, is, uh, is extremely good. Um, <clears throat> so I'm presenting uh, on behalf of the Balthub project. Um, we have... Um, I am from uh, Tallinn University of Technology. We also have uh, two departments from uh, Technical University of Denmark on board. We have uh, DTU Wind Energy and uh, DTU Management. Uh, then we have uh, Kaunas Technical University from Lithuania and, and Sintef uh, from Norway. And, and with this team, we, uh, we really cover um, a variety of, uh, of topic, topics you, you will see in, in just a minute. Um, what we aim to, to study here is, is to see how cost-effective uh, offshore energy hubs in the Baltic Sea can be. Um, this project was somehow uh, inspired by a similar exercise which was done in the North Sea a, a few years ago. And uh, now the same methodology has been applied in the Baltic Sea area. However, with some uh, significant uh, improvements in, uh, in the analysis. I, I will get that back to that in, in a second as well. Um, so we, we aim to see how cost competitive offshore energy hubs can be. And, uh, and with that, we also wish to analyze how to interconnect them because if you build some kind of large, large hub where you can connect several gigawatts of, of offshore wind turbine, for example, um, it might be uh, quite a distance away from the shore, so you don't even have the question whether to connect it to country A or country B. You can even connect it to both or maybe even three countries. So the grid configuration that comes with uh, with the offshore energy hubs is, is quite important. And, and this is also that we, we try to tackle quite, uh, in quite a detailed way in, in this study. And um, we have analyzed a, a few scenarios up to, up to 2050. Uh, we have we considered a, a lot more scenarios, but we have detected that uh, one of the key drivers of, of the of the level of offshore wind rollout in, in the Baltic Sea area is, uh, is the level of electrification we see. So we have analyzed various levels of electrification. Uh, in our model, we have um, quite a detailed way of, of representing this. We have different sectors, for example, uh, power to heat or power to hydrogen, and also these different sectors of electricity consumption deliver uh, a variable level of, of flexibility. For instance, uh, electrolyzers can be coupled with hydrogen storage, which is quite a flexible um, electric demand in the end. We, we analyzed this all in a variety of, of mathematical models, and I think this structure here represents the flow of our project very well. On the left side here, you can see uh, we have started off with some very detailed uh, wind energy modeling from DTO Wind. Um, and and in, in this time, uh, DTO Wind uh, 
really took uh, uh, up the task of analyzing what is the effect of scaling wind power. Uh, and um, if we construct a large wind park in, in one place, you can see um, several effects that uh, manifest themselves. Uh, firstly, on the lower side, you can see which is uh, represented by Pi Wake. Uh, if you analyze how wind moves around individual turbines, you can see that uh, the generation of subsequent wind turbines downwind is, is reduced a little bit. So this is what we call uh, small scale um, wakes. So that has an, the larger the wind park, the, the more significant effect. But we also see that if you start constructing really, really large scale uh, offshore energy hubs in, in several gigawatts, you can also start seeing mesoscale effects, meaning uh, basically in the large scale area, you can see that the entire um, wind mass uh, starts lo losing its kinetic energy. So we see these effects kick in at different uh, uh, well, scalability levels. I have an image of that uh, quite soon. But this wake analysis and, and, uh, and this wind power generation analysis concludes in the chorus model, which then delivers uh, these very detailed wind and solar generation time series into Balmoral. And Balmoral takes this wind data as input and, um, and, and models the energy system. So Balmoral is, is an optimization system which uh, provides as output to user with the cheapest or the most economically efficient way of fulfilling the given demand according to the input criteria. Within Balmoral, we analyze our scenarios and we, we deliver these scenari scenarios to the power GIM model, which aims to take a look at the uncertainty in, um, in grid expansion. The key issue here is, as I said, we investigate different grid configurations meshed grid and, uh, and radial grid connected to one country or several countries or bidding zones. And it might be that one grid configuration is optimal for in, in one scenario, another grid configuration is optimal in another scenario. Then the question is, we go to policymakers, they ask what kind of grid should we build? Well, yeah, we, we don't know what kind of scenario will be realized, but the power GIM model will take this uncertainty into account and try to detect um, the no regret grid investment options for us. So that's kind of putting the optimization results in, um, into, into no regret decisions uh, for the policymakers. Uh, we have in our project uh, completed uh, almost everything in, in the in the first four blocks. So we have Balmoral model results. We want to go a little bit deeper, uh, analyze some more technical aspects. I will touch upon that in a second. Uh, and, and the power GIM modeling is, is, is underway. So today I will not be able to show you results, but in the final version there will be. These are the offshore hubs on the right side that we analyze. Uh, these pink little dots are our sites that we have detected are perspective. These have been chosen according to sea depth, meaning the economic possibility of constructing an offshore wind hub and also the wind resource in the area. Um, and, and coupled with, the, with each of these hubs is the specific wind resource and the effect of uh, wake losses. Uh, and here you can see a comparison between the, the micro scale and, and the meso scale uh, wake losses. So if we include the, the large area of effect losses, as I described earlier, you can see that if we go into hub sizes of around six gigawatts, then the uh, mm, power generation loss or, or reduction is, is already quite significant. 
And uh, just to highlight here, the, the lower the original wind speed in the area, the more significant this effect will be. So just running ahead a little bit, this significantly affects the competitiveness of hubs. For example, on this map here, you see in the north between Finland and Sweden because the wind speeds there are not particularly high to begin with. On the left, you can see what is the uh, geographic area that we analyze in Balmoral. So, of course, our target is to model the Baltic Sea area, and that, for that, we analyze specific results. But in order to represent the larger context of the energy system development, we include an area which is much uh, larger in the model. Uh, for example, France is significant with its uh, particularly high electricity demand. So uh, large energy systems like that are important to include in our analysis as well because they have an impact. And, and on the right side, you can see the three scenarios we, we analyze uh, in the most modest scenario called heat only. We just uh, optimize power to heat scenario. This scenario will very roughly indicates uh, somehow a, a business as usual demand trend so that we don't see a significant increase or decrease uh, roughly cruising on the same level as now. Then we have a more electrified scenario where we have um, uh, electric mobility added uh, and then the all electrified scenario where we add a lot of uh, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen demand uh, into the model for uh, industry and, and, uh, and transport fuels. Uh, and uh, so as I said, we have uh, mm, analyzed the power system with the Balmoral model uh, quite extensively already. And here you can see the first results. Um, because we allow the model to make uh, decisions on certain type of demand, for example, uh, the model has an option how much it would, in a particular uh, district heating network, uh, to supply heat from, let's say, uh, biomass boilers or heat pumps. Then in the model results, we can also observe the realized load because the model has some kind of decision points regarding that. Uh, and you can see how this load varies according to sectors. And of course, naturally, the all electrified uh, scenario sees the most substantial um, increase in demand. And of course, the demand increase is delivered by uh, hydrogen production as, as was defined by input. But this is just to illustrate how much demand uh, varies uh, uh, in our model. And, uh, and, and uh, here is how the production side varies. Um, what is interesting to see is that we observe all kinds of renewable sources delivering the additional energy that we see uh, in the all electrified scenario. We see offshore uh, hubs, so that's uh, wind power in mesh, mesh grid uh, configuration, radially connected, but also solar. But this is for the whole region. Um, uh, and also to show where electricity is used in terms of heat and, and hydrogen produ production, how these, um, how these develop over the year. But <clears throat> our focus was on the Baltic Sea area. So the electricity production and particularly interesting would be the, the offshore grid rollout in, in the Baltic Sea area that we can see that um, hub, hubbed wind or, or mesh, meshed grid configuration wind has um, perspective in, in all three scenarios, but we see a substantial increase in, in, uh, in offshore hubs if we see a lot of uh, flexible demand put into the model. And what is particularly interesting, we uh, in, in the most ambitious scenario, we, we arrive at similar numbers as has been uh, 
presented in, in, in Wind Europe's uh, vision for 2050. And as I said, we, we also take a look at the grid configurations uh, quite a lot. So this is not yet from power gim modeling. I think the colors might be a little bit uh, bright to see, but in the all electrified scenario, we can see which pubs hop up, uh, pop up. So all the light blue ones are hubs, and we see some hubs which are quite large, up to four gigawatts. Hubs larger than four gigawatts have not been attractive due to the large scale weight losses. And we see quite a lot of interconnectors. All of these uh, orange lines are interconnectors that the model chooses. Um, we see the same thing with the, with the low demand scenario, but I, what I think is particularly interesting in the, the, sorry, that was the middle load scenario. Even in the low load scenario, we see some hubs pop up, hubs up to the size of two gigawatt and still some mesh grid configuration. Uh, I think particularly we see one hub near Estonia, which is connected to, I think, three or four countries. Um, and just, just a small disclaimer here. Uh, here we sometimes see very small lines pop up. I think if we see lines between, I don't know, Sweden and Lithuania, for example, which are just a few hundred megawatts, we can think that that's not economically feasible. Thank you. And we aim to, aim to remove that in, in our next model run. Um, but I think the, the main, uh, main message is here, we have some quite strong lines uh, between countries, one gigawatt or more. Um, yeah, and naturally we, we found that if the system is highly electrified, offshore hubs are more attractive. But I think it's very important to note that even in the not most uh, electrified scenario, we see offshore energy hubs. So I think it's necessary to turn some attention to that, to, to the cooperation um, uh, between the countries around the Baltic Sea. Um, the Baltic Sea area faces uh, lower wind speeds as, as north, north, the North Sea area, so some sites are not attractive, so we should really prioritize where to develop energy hubs. Um, <clears throat> as I said, we, we want to clarify just a little bit how, how or uh, the, the grid modeling, so that we would uh, remove the small unattractive lines which would uh, uh, be subject or which would not benefit from the economy of scale of, of large lines. Uh, and, uh, and yes, as a final point, we, we still aim to deliver the, the power gim uh, results, which would uh, aim to deliver um, a robust grid expansion pathway. So something that we can say this works with um, any kind of future or, or any kind of uh, electrification level that, that we might uh, expect. But that is it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So one question for you as well. Uh, so we had a year with uh, extremely high electricity prices, both in the Baltics, but also in the Nordic countries. How does this uh, price increase uh, the impact the economical assessment of of the, the offshore wind farms you, you're looking into here? That, that's, that's a very good question and, and a very difficult one <laughs> because uh, when, uh, when we talk unofficially in, in the corridors, we see that, 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 that wind power has become very attractive. People want to invest in it, but on the other side we have, we are hearing that there is kind of a supply problem, that mm -hmm. you want to build a park and you have to wait for five years for the turbines to arrive, for example. So I think people want to make this decision now. They, they want to build, but I think the uncertainty whether in five years we will have the same attractive price is very high. So I don't know how, <laughs> if I can give you a straight answer on this. Well, uh, thank you. And so for the last speaker before the break, we'll uh, welcome uh, 
Ernst Biko. Uh, he is a PhD student at the Lithuanian Energy Institute, and he's a PhD student and a junior researcher at the Lithuanian Energy Institute, and he will tell us a little bit about the experience of being a PhD student uh, within the Joint Baltic Nordic Energy Research Program, but also under the COVID pandemic. So welcome. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi to everyone. Thank you for letting me to make a sort of small speech. I'm not going to consume a lot of your time, just a brief uh, stuff, you know, what um, what happened. I joined the program at the last stages of the program and um, the biggest profit that I was able to consume from it is the possibility to go to the Sweden, to the Gasification Academy. Uh, basically, it was extremely great stuff because uh, seven days, a really intensive course, um, which was able to provide me the knowledge about how to do the thermogrammetrical analysis, the gas chromatography analysis, which are widely used in the um, gasification sphere and uh, like uh, without that of course it is still possible to learn from the internet and stuff but the quality of the knowledge would be completely different so uh, I was not working directly under some projects by the I mean I was under the Ramanet of course but I was not directly working with something I only participated in this uh, summer school and uh, I want to say like the words of thanks to the program to the possibility that it gives to I'm not speaking only for myself I'm speaking mostly for like for all the PhD students for the possibility to join mobility programs to like visit all the summer schools because I see that there are a lot of guys from the Sweden summer school are still now here for example yeah and I hope that we grabbed a lot of like pos positive points from these possibilities and that was a great experience. So thank you for allowing us to have this experience. So thank you. Thank you, Ernst. Yeah, if you're interested in something, if not, no questions. Yeah. <laughs> So with that, I think we might go for a break a little early. Uh, we'll be back at 10.45. Uh, there's coffee on the sides and there are posters on the walls. So enjoy your break.
So, if everyone could uh, just uh, find uh, somewhere to sit. And we'll begin after the break. We, we will. So, welcome again. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the break. We will begin this, uh, this session by a greeting from the Minister Rina Sikut from the Estonian Ministry of Economic, Economic Affairs and Communications uh, and she will be uh, shown on video. So, uh, Greetings from Tallinn to all uh, the participants of the joint the Baltic Nordic uh, Energy uh, Research Conference. I'm, I'm very grateful for all the scientists uh, who work on solving uh, the issues that hold us back from the renewable and, and energy efficient future and also everyone else who enable the researchers uh, to do their best. Uh, I understand that the current energy crisis uh, have made us all quite insecure. What's the way forward? But I would like to ensure you that although this winter or the next one might be tough for everyone, I strongly believe that the current crisis is actually moving us towards the climate neutral and energy efficient future in a faster pace than uh, we would have expected otherwise. And I would like to uh, point out uh, three things why I consider uh, your contribution and cooperation extremely important. Uh, first, mm, the renewable uh, energy future. Estonia, for example, uh, just adopted a law that set a very ambitious target that we should produce uh, uh, the same amount of electricity we consume uh, over the year uh, from renewable uh, sources. Uh, and the goal is clear, it's, it's understandable, it's set, but the path towards it requires new solutions and the best knowledge. Uh, so this is uh, the, the, the uh, effort that you all need to put in how to solve the question for uh, all the states in the Baltic and Nordic region. And uh, although we, we know which way to go, uh, the specific solutions uh, can be uh, probably improved and cooperation. When we talk about uh, a large uh, share of renewable energy in, in our energy mix, uh, then mm, connections between countries and uh, mm, regional approach to, to energy uh, security and energy adequacy, it's, it's essential. We can't solve the uh, puzzle state by state or country by country. Uh, we have to do it for a region. Mm, uh, secondly, uh, energy efficiency. Uh, how to renovate our buildings, how to uh, make the use of energy uh, uh, reasonable. We don't want to uh, waste resources in Estonia or any other Baltic or Nordic uh, uh, country. How do we do it? And it has to be uh, working on in the background. It has to be comfortable for, for every uh, domestic or business uh, user as well. Uh, we can't achieve energy efficiency if it requires day-by-day -day decisions or, or turning off and on a switch uh, by every single uh, person. It, it has to be smart digital, uh, de this demand response solutions and, and so on. And uh, in addition to uh, renewable energy uh, mm, uh, solutions, uh, energy efficiency uh, improvements, a third uh, transport. It's a challenge for Estonia and there is a large behavioral component in that. How do we make everyone behave in a way that it's uh, uh, reasonable to, to, uh, to reduce uh, CO2 waste, but it doesn't uh, uh, change our uh, daily life that much. That we can still go to work and school and uh, do everything else, but 
the ecological footprint is much smaller. So uh, in Estonia, when we look at the uh, uh, CO2 waste in general, I would say the transport sector is most challenging and also common solutions uh, are, are needed in that area uh, as well. Uh, so I, I hope you'll have uh, uh, good uh, debates, uh, a very nice networking opportunity and uh, uh, you, you put the, I don't know, the, the uh, base for uh, solving uh, very important uh, problems uh, in the Baltic and Nordic region uh, in order for every one of us to achieve uh, uh, the climate neutral neutrality goals uh, uh, that, that we believe in. Uh, so all the best and hope to see you soon. Next up is our uh, senior researchers from VTT, uh, Tommy Lindros. He uh, specializes in energy system models. Uh, and together with his team, he's working on different types of modules such as the Times, Backbone, uh, and the Arena Flex tool, and use them in various uh, academic and company projects. The models can be used to look into energy policies, emission reductions, uh, and different types of deep technological changes. And on his uh, spare time, he enjoys climbing, both indoors and outdoors. I know you also do some um, frisbee golf, and he can also show you around in Helsinki if you need somewhere to drink a beer as well. <laughs> so welcome, Tommy. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, it's great to see you all here. And uh, uh, I'll tell a summary of what we did in the modeling the project of the Baltic countries and tell a quick summary of the results. The focus was on uh, additional energy and climate policies that could be done in near term. When we did start this project in, was it 20, early 2020, and we're planning this project in early 2019, uh, we couldn't guess how uh, uh, up to date it would be on, on the time of release when we are now many people are asking questions that what more could be done to to reduce either natural gas use or the emissions or decrease the costs of the energy system so this is not including the most recent developments but answers to some of those questions let me see how I can change the slide ah oh, change is there great so uh, this is a quick summary of the energy and climate targets of the Baltic countries. It's not covering everything, but it tries to cover the most important ones. So the Baltic countries are in a situation where they try to simultaneously reduce emissions, uh, decrease the dependency on the Russian electricity and Russian gas, uh, including the desynchronization from the Russian electricity grid and synchronizing to the Central European electricity grid. And at the same time, the Baltic countries uh, want to have a higher domestic share of electricity generation and a higher share of uh, local renewable electricity sources, for example, the biomass and wind power. And of course, we wouldn't like to see a uh, large increase of costs despite wanting to achieve all those uh, quite ambitious targets. And uh, we did study different measures how we could increase the, the development regarding these targets and uh, applied a range of different metrics to, to see how different measures would impact. But uh, before going to results, here's a very quick summary how the Baltic power system looks today. Um, there are Mm, the three Baltic countries, this, the figures, the Dubai diagrams, they show the main sources of the electricity of each country. And then the numbers within the countries, for example in Estonia, the 1.9 gigawatt, that shows the peak demand. And uh, the electricity interconnectors, they are drawn there as uh, arrows. We didn't include capacities in this figure. 
So the Baltic countries, uh, the electricity generation mix varies largely from country to country, and the local resources also vary largely. So, for example, the Latvia has a high share of hydropower that gives local flexibility. It's not as large storages or reservoirs as in Norway, but something still that can be used in the daily balancing. And Lithuania, for example, is a highly connected country. So there are a high number of electricity interconnections to all neighboring countries. And uh, uh, even when looking to the electricity demand of Lithuania, the interconnectors have a very high capacity. So that kind of uh, interconnectedness rate is very high in Lithuania. But when we go to towards 2030, there are huge changes going on. So when the desynchronization from the Russian grid happens, the interconnectors towards Russia and the Kaliningrad would be either closed down or alternated to, to uh, well, less used ones. But in, in current situation, it might go as it is in the figure. And the interconnectors from north-south direction, so between the Baltic countries and towards Poland, would be strengthened. And at the same time, the capacity of solar PV is likely to increase from current roughly 100 megawatts to up to two or more gigawatts. And the amount of wind power, it highly depends on acceptability. And many things Hardy spoke uh, in a previous presentation, but the capacity of wind power, both onshore and offshore, could also increase up to four gigawatts. And uh, when, when we look at the <clears throat> capacities, electricity generation capacities of these countries, the variable capacity would be a very large share in power. Mm. Here's a quick graph comparing the electricity generation in 2017 and 2030. And uh, the biggest change is there. It, this is our own reference scenario. So just to, to make it clear here, these are not from the National Climate and Energy Plans. We did do assumptions following those plans, but not strictly. And uh, especially the development of wind and solar has been increasing a lot in recent years. And what we can see here is that uh, especially if Estonia phases out the shale oil, that would reduce the amount of domestic generation quite a lot and would convert Estonia from electricity net exporter to electricity net importer. This might not happen now when there is a much, much higher concern of the energy security than what there was when we did these results. And most of the European countries have been revising the plans of fossil fuel phase out and might actually keep up the fossil fuel capacity longer than what we can see in these scenarios. But uh, the amount of wind power and solar power would increase a lot. and. Uh, in all of the Baltic countries, they would correspond uh, a major share of an annual electricity generation. <clears throat> and when we look to uh, transport sector, it's a uh, you could think it as only emissions or cost-wise or how people prefer to move around. But from a political perspective, transport sector is a little bit difficult because the emissions are accounted as a non-ETS emissions. So that's a highly technical term that's used in EU policies. But uh, each European country, they do have a national target for non-ETS emission trading sector emissions. So from the emission trading sector, you pay the price of emissions or the companies must pay. But the countries and the governments are responsible of emissions outside the emission trading scheme. 
and transport is the main sector there. And when we were looking at the development of the Baltic transport sector, it seems that the amount of mobility is increasing quite fast in the Baltic countries, which means more cars and more kilometers traveled per car. And despite uh, an increase of electric vehicles, it might, won't happen as fast as in Nordic countries, but uh, some share of electric vehicles will appear also in Baltic countries by 2030. But despite that increase, the sheer increase of transport volume is larger, and that's likely to lead to an increase in transport sector emissions, which makes it very difficult to achieve the national non-ETS targets without additional measures. And uh, when you look at the figure there, it shows the model CO2 emissions. So we can see that the overall emissions in all of the three countries were decreasing. But some that kind of a political or climate targets might not be achieved if the transport sector emissions are increasing. So this is a problem arising from the fact that each country actually have multiple targets. And uh, here is a very short and quick summary of the results. So in the project we did study a range of additional measures. So in the, in the figure or in the table, the studied additional measures are in a column with a dark orange color. For example, <clears throat> increasing the amount of wind power, increasing the amount of solar power. And uh, the analyzed impacts are on a light orange color. So how it reduces, the first one is those emission trading sector CO2 emissions. And the second column is, are those non-ETS emissions. And uh, then the, those RESE, that's a re renewable energy share in electricity, heating and transport. And then each European country, they, they also have targets for primary energy use or final energy use. This is called energy efficiency targets, also coming from the EU. And uh, the energy security targets, those are mostly national targets, so countries are wanting to achieve higher energy security. And the last row is the cost. So whatever we will do, it will have some cost impacts. And uh, w when we are looking at those additional policy measures, one thing we note that none of the studied measures uh, would be always beneficial from every indicator. So w when you look at the, the cell, if, if that cell is green, it indicates that that action would make the situation better according to that indicator. Or if the cell is red, it says that the situation goes worse from that perspective. So for example, <clears throat> mm, well, when we look at adding heat pumps, that's a good example. So it increases the electricity demand. So that increases emissions in the power and heat, heat power sector, but uh, it reduces emissions elsewhere. And uh, similar with electric vehicles. So electric vehicles, they will reduce the transport sector emissions, but increase the emissions in power sector. And uh, <clears throat> Some of these measures had a stronger impact in, in certain category. So the darker the color is, the stronger the impact is. And uh, the, uh, we, we couldn't analyze the cost impacts of each measure. So for example, reducing the transport demand or transport volumes, for example, replacing or switching from private cars to public transport, we couldn't say the cost impact. But uh, we, we tried to provide this kind of a broad range of impacts of different measures for the policymakers. And uh, cannot say which would be the best, but it really depends how these different indicators are valued in a policy making. So two years ago when we were doing this analysis, uh, there was a high stress on the emission reductions and increasing of renewable energy. But when looking at these results nowadays, uh, the, the policymaker maybe would like to end, uh, stress more the energy security. But uh, our report, there's uh, 
Well, there's not link there, but you can find the link from the Nordic Energy Research website. And uh, the, the report shows the analysis behind that how we came up with these conclusions and how, did, how we actually did the modeling and show the numerical results and actually much more details than you want to know, probably. But uh, <clears throat> I have few additional slides and few additional minutes. So we picked up from our result pool some national results. So when, when looking the Estonian results, mm, we noticed that if the oil, shale oil phase out would happen, there would be quite great need for replacing or additional capacity. And this, this slide is written from the assumption that the shale oil phase out would happen as the, the Estonian government had a plan two or three years ago. It might have been updated, but be, one of the measures we did study was to, to keep up the existing oil shale capacity as a backup. And the two cheapest measures to add national capacity was found out to in, uh, have grid batteries as a backup unit or keep the existing shale oil units as a backup. And uh, after this study, the, we found out that the Estonian, uh, or if all Baltic countries actually decided to invest to grid batteries as, as a reserve source. Looking to Latvia, uh, in our analysis, we find a high risk that additional wind power does reduce the operation hours of large CHP units in Riga. So when you build more wind power, it reduces the electricity prices that reduces the profitability of the CHP unit. And in an upper figure, there is an hourly oper operation of uh, Latvian system if we assume no additional wind at all. And in a lower figure, when we assume assume an additional wind. So the, the Latvian system, the electricity generation would be mostly from hydropower, wind power and electricity trade between the neighboring countries, which leaves very little space for the CHP units, which as an effect risks the economical operation of the CHP units and might lead to unwanted, unwanted capacity phase out. It's not certain that it will happen, but it was, was found out as risk in the study. And then the last one from Lithuania, that uh, in that kind of a 2030 reference scenario, there was very, very high share of variable renewable electricity in Lithuania. That means wind and solar. And uh, that, that's a higher share than what we actually see in any European country at the moment. And uh, we do not have operation experience from such high annual VRE shares from any country in the world. And it's maybe not a problem, but uh, it's a definitely something that should be studied more. And uh, I was flagged out, so thank you. Oh, there's one slide more. We don't have time for that. But uh, we, we did write a summary of these opportunities, risks and threats for each Baltic country and the region in general. And uh, I hope you can find time to, to check the res project results. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. So you might also keep uh, some of these uh, results in mind for the panel discussion as well. Uh, I wanted to ask you, how do you feel, you mentioned it slightly, but how do you feel that the relevance of your research have have been changing since you began the project and after these, the current events and the changes in the geopolitical uh, context and energy context? Mm. Yeah, that, that's a good one. And there's two major changes I see. One is the emphasis of energy security and unknown risks. So we, the energy systems are facing quite many risks we didn't analyze only a few years ago. And the second one are the high prices. So this research, we did not have a high price scenario like we see prices today. And uh, it would change how we uh, interpret or find out the results, especially regarding the domestic generation capacity. So whatever could replace natural gas 
today would be seen much more profitable than what we do see in this study. Thank you. Then I think we would move over to the uh, panel discussion, so you could take a seat over there. And we would also like to welcome Anna and Hardy and Ernest as well. So I'll start with an opening question, but uh, we also hope to get uh, a couple of questions from the audience as well. Um, just trying to find out who's, who will manage the microphone. Uh, will that be you, Ditte? Yes. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand and ask, and Ditte will help you to, uh, to show that. I'm just putting up the correct slide here as well. So I can also come to this side. You have each one of your microphones. So I would like to start by asking each and one of you, and you might also join. Great. So I think the first question from us at Nordic Energy Research is, uh, based on your research, what is the main policy recommendation that you would give to the policy representatives here today? Uh, and then I think we could continue with uh, Tommy's uh, so that he can give some of the results from his last slide here. We had to figure out a few policy recommendations for the poster because that was kindly asked by the Nordic NS research. And uh, in, in our research, we, we wanted to just analyze the impacts by different indicators to, to give the policymakers the background information and give them the required information to choose. But w when you're giving a policy recommendation, we do a lot of assumptions that what's actually wanted by the Baltic countries. But uh, we tried to pick one which is a safe one. So when we go towards 2030, in all our modelings, we see an increase of costs, despite what, what's happening. But when new wind and solar power is built, that will reduce the cost increase in all our modelings. Thank you. Hardy, what would you follow up with? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I have been mostly in included in projects which analyze the energy system um, between uh, a larger area. For example, in, in Balthub, we, we analyzed the, the Baltic Sea area, and, and in, in all the projects, we have included such, such a large um, um, region of, of Europe. And what, what we see, and, and what I personally believe, is that, uh, as I also said in, in the presentation, that regional cooperation has, has many benefits. Um, there are some initiatives uh, between, uh, for example, Estonia and Latvia to start developing common uh, offshore grid. I would encourage to go in this direction with even more enthusiasm and courage. And um, I, I think Maybe this, uh, an, another aspect that I would highlight, perhaps is uh, already known by policymakers, is uh, uh, simplify the, the all aspects of uh, renewable energy rollout for investors. Try to make planning more streamlined. Uh, try to include all necessary parties in a simpler manner, so which would make investments more uh, easy to make. Thanks. Anna. So my topic of uh, research where I have been involved within uh, this program is related to heating sector. And uh, actually, if we analyze all our three countries, uh, we have such trend or tendency to, to that uh, this uh, climate um, transition uh, transition to clean energy is focused on biomass biomass burning for sure it is due to our specific condition geographical conditions and availability and my recommendation would be to be more open minded to new type of uh, um, heat generation technology and i know that many steps already have been done but uh, as we 
could see from, from other projects, so this power to heat option will be one of the future development development areas and um, uh, actually in this way non-traditional heat sources should be taken into account low temperature heat source and ultra low temperature heat sources and we tried to provide some tools for it and uh, but for sure it will be not so obvious not so short-term solution long-term solution and hope that we will be successful in this direction. And you? Yeah, I hardly could be called a you know, good advisor to the regulators, but from my actually point of view, um, the overall um, energy, let's say, situation on energy market and so on, uh, it's a bit over-regulated by now for at least the small-scale generation stuff. So from I'm not a professional by so far, but from my point of view as a PhD student, the number of regulations that is um, somehow applied to small-scale generation should decrease to make it is is the market easier to make a first step for new companies and so on because a lot of um, at least projects were stopped from my personal experience were stopped just because the people faced the troubles with um, um, or uh, just you know regulators and stuff, and they need to collect tons of uh, tons of permissions to do like at least even super basic things. So um, it should be somehow changed. Like I do not have, of course, it's only super general and basic words, and everybody understands that. But I do not have a exact plan. If I would have such a plan, I would not be sitting here, you know. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Are there any questions from the uh, audience? Raise, yeah. And you could, if you could also state your name as well. Yeah. Michael Jorgensen from Aalborg University. I, I would like to, in relate to what you from VTT talked about these different scenarios. Have you tried to use those scenarios in some policy discussions to kind of show that if this could be the future, would that be a uh, reasonable future and then have discussions about how to reach that future? In short, yes. So w we do that kind of work with the Finnish ministries all the time. And uh, we have published or participated in the large Nordic collaboration doing a, this kind of a regional analysis for the Nordic region and uh, more recently also for the Baltic region. And uh, for us as a Finnish research organization, it's always a difficult, a bit difficult to discuss with the Baltic ministries or, for example, Swedish ministries. And that's where we use uh, or have local partners. And uh, but it, it's always, uh, to be honest, it's uh, it's something where we what we could do a lot better to to speak more with the local ministries about these results and ask how they would like to see this used and improved. I think there was a hand uh, back here from Avidas. You'll get a microphone as well. I have a question to Project Leader. Hello, I, I have a question to the Project Leader who was analyzing uh, so-called uh, wind hubs or something like this. So as I understood, you analyzed the development of offshore wind farms and connection of those farms together and with the countries. But my question would be, have you analyzed simultaneously wind and solar power generation development in inland, uh, onshore? And have you analyzed grid uh, throughput capacities or sufficiency of, of the grid in, in those countries? So, how how grid uh, is sufficient or not to transmit those those new capacities thank you uh thank you that's that's actually a, a very good question um y yes we, we along with the wind data that was delivered for offshore hubs uh, dtu wind energy actually provided these profiles for also uh, onshore installations so from the same model, uh, we received uh, hourly generation profiles 
and capacity factors for uh, the whole modeled area. Uh, of course, like in this case, the, the onshore wind modeling was um, not so detailed in a sense that, for example, for the Baltic countries, you could have different hubs with different um, resource quality in, in one Baltic area, but the onshore quality would be the same within one Baltic bidding zone. Um, so, yes, we modeled it, and, and the model always had to choose uh, to uh, which resource to use to fulfill the demand. So the model had the choice of rolling out less onshore wind in favor of offshore wind. So it was, it was a, a decision point for the model. Um, regarding your second question, we use Balmoral, which doesn't have uh, a lot of technical capabilities regarding modeling the grid. Um, but we acknowledge the problem that uh, that in regards of grid costs, there is much more than bringing the cable from the offshore hub to the shore. You also have to reinforce the grid onshore, uh, and perhaps the reinforcement must take place many kilometers from the place where the cable lands. Um, and and this is a problem because our model also made investments in, in, in onshore, onshore connections, for example, between Latvia and Lithuania. So we, in order to try to deliver an equal playing field among these different interconnectors, we determined that every, uh, every interconnector from, for example, offshore hub or from a neighboring country uh, must land in, in the same connection point. So for instance, um, uh, when calculating grid connection costs for an offshore hub in Estonia, we assume that the cable must be brought from the hub into the center of Estonia. So this is not uh, an entirely accurate description of, of how much the grid must be expanded, but we, we somehow brought the cables into level playing field because, for example, if there is uh, a connection between Latvia and Estonia, then the, the, the new AC line must not only cross the border, but it must connect the middle of Estonia to the middle of Latvia to kind of represent a little bit of internal grid reinforcement. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah? Xin uh, Xin from Danana University in Sweden. So we haven't been talked so much about energy storage today, so which is quite important to energy or systems. And my question goes to probably everyone here. So. We have a few th options now, like thermal storage or batteries. And in the future, especially in the Nordic area, we're starting to discuss about the possibility of using hydrogen. Uh, we had a lot, for, especially for industry now. So in your opinion, what do you think about the different, different energy storage techniques in your particular area? Uh, who, what kind of role they will play in the future? And uh, particularly for hydrogen, especially any, any plans for what uh, countries have uh, so far for hydrogens? Thank you. So I think we'll start with uh, Ernst. Yeah, okay. Uh, what I can say that, uh, for example, personally I and uh, our lab uh, does not, we does not work with the hydrogen, but mm -hmm. at the same time we work with ammonia as a hydrogen carrier because hydrogen itself is quite um, uh, questionable stuff if in the meaning of uh, transportation and uh, holding because it requires, you know, high pressures and uh, for being like uh, stored and so, so on. So we are now focusing on other hydrogen um, carriers that are not hydrogen and ammonia. If we would be able to solve, and now we are like going to work with this problem, we would be able to solve the emission of the nitrogen excites because ammonia contains nitrogen as we all know. Uh, it could be also sort of a solution for the problem, which is, would be also related to the hydrogen. But uh, we are going to use not the direct combustion or whatever, but uh, plasma-assisted reforming, plasma-assisted combustion. So those technologies, at least I can speak from, uh, you know, my lab, my, we are working on this. Maybe somebody is doing something else, but I'm personally doing that. So. Partially, we are in the thematic, but not directly with hydrogen, but hydrogen-containing fuels, let's say. Something like that. Yeah. 
Anna. Yes, I would go, go back from hydrogen to, to heating <laughs> <laughs> because uh, many analyses have shown that uh, using hydrogen for heating not uh, the best option because you can use it for much higher energy. energy and uh, uh, actually, but uh, this um, energy storage topic for sure is actual both for heating and uh, power power. Uh, power grids because uh, we have uh, more and more due to renewable energy implementation and waste heat, uh, waste energy implementation, we have uh, more and more fluctu uh, fluctuating uh, energy production and uh, which will not be the same as energy uh, consumption and in this way for sure variable energy storage are needed and uh, I I, I would tell that they are needed on the level that uh, when it's used for, so for heating, it can be uh, thermal energy storage, both uh, short term and long term, depending on, on needs and uh, heat production. And for sure, for electricity, we have, uh, I don't know if you have in your model this hydro power, uh, this. Uh, um, uh, energy storage and so on, so because we, we will need it because of this fluctuate, fluctuating and not stable uh, energy production. And it is absolutely uh, uh, topic number one, That, but we don't have just exact project about it, yes? Mm -hmm. Because it was not as a, um, as a, as a main uh, uh, topic, uh, how it is, uh, aim of, uh, of interest, uh, main mm -hmm. aim, maybe you should add it. To the next uh, to the next stage, just to get more project on it. Yeah, thank you, Hardy. Uh, yes, I I'm in 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 favor of, of flexibility and, and storage in, in any shape and form, <laughs> and uh, I I I have this feeling from the analysis that that I have performed over the various projects is that you know there is no simple one solution to, to any problem. Uh, we, we have to use all the available options. So for example, in, in one of the earlier projects al also funded by Nordic Energy Research, we investigated a lot of uh, uh, heat storage coupled with power to heat options in district heating networks. That's, that's a huge opportunity and, and actually we, have, we are seeing first investments of that happening in Estonia right now. Also, electric boilers, which can be very flexible and deliver ancillary services to the power system in the same framework. Um, we already have devices which can turn residential homes uh, more flexible. For example, I have uh, for, for quite a few years already at home a thing which organizes my floor heating according to the day ahead spot price, optimizes my costs without me doing anything. Um, and uh, so, I think if we're looking to flexibility, we should be looking everywhere, absolutely everywhere. But of course, there are some um, local projects, local conditions that, that we should also try to uh, uh, utilize. So for example, uh, pumped hydro storage, quite uh, a lot used. Um, and of course, conventional hydro in, in Norway, Sweden, very flexible, um, but we have also somewhat of a novel project in, in Estonia where uh, some private entrepreneurs are considering building an our underground storage. So building a pumped, a pumped hydro reservoir, uh, although in Estonia we have uh, no hills, no, <laughs> no mountains. So they have detected an opportunity. I think that's a very good idea just to deliver additional flexibility coupled with other things. Now in regards of hydrogen, uh, I don't know, as I, as I don't believe there is one single key, I think hydrogen can certainly play a role. I don't know what role this will be because there's a tight competition with chemical batteries. Uh, I think it will really depend on how the technology evolves. The cost of chemical batteries is coming down due to technological innovations. On the other hand, we have pressure from uh, material prices. Um, both technologies are subject to significant innovations. I think, I believe. So I personally don't know which will be better. Tommy? Quite much was already said, but maybe one point to add is that uh, 
the, the need for storage from the system side increases when the num uh, amount of wind and solar increases. So currently we are already starting to see high di price differences between, for example, night and day, or when it winds and when it doesn't wind. And that creates the economical basis for the storage investments from the energy point of view. And uh, so far it, it's been mostly within a day, like for example the Lithuanian pumped hydro system. Or the, but w when we are going to very, very high wind and solar shares, we, we start to need weekly storages or even monthly storages. And these are currently handled with fossil fuel storages. So you have a pile of coal. But when we start reducing the phasing out the fossil fuels, we will start seeing the challenge of uh, monthly and seasonal storages, which will be a big challenge. And that was not included in our study because we studied the near term changes. Other questions from the audience? Yeah. Great. Okay, we um, have a few, but uh, should we start maybe over here? First, and then, uh, second, and then third. Recently, I learned that uh, Latvian uh, system are foreseeing some reserves, so it means some 400 uh, megawatt or something like that. Uh, and especially if we talk about those hubs, uh, how to create? Uh, have you thought about uh, maybe we? No, oh, because we are in Nordic uh, grid and we could connect uh, different ways. Maybe the cable between Finland is cheaper than great somewhere here, something like that. Uh, where is this, um, have you seen uh, or, or calculated something like that? Could you also give a short introduction first? Ansis Sabotins from Riga Technical University. Sorry. Thank you. Anyone that would like to answer? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think it's, it's quite an important question. And uh, we have not explicitly um, modeled the reserves in, in a very detailed way. There is usually in energy system models we have included something like a reserve margin that we say that a certain amount of capacity must be well unused so that that would be in case of co contingencies but that, that's a simplistic approach and uh, um, perhaps that is a, a, an aspect that should be studied further um, I think, or uh, again, as, as I, uh, I hope that as the system develops, uh, I think the system also adapts in terms of uh, also those renewable energy sources able to offer flexibility. Uh, I think we have seen an indication, for example, from the largest wind power producer in Estonia that they would be able to offer down regulation services uh, at of a significant portion of their production. So they are already able to provide the service in one direction. Uh, I would think it's, it's not uh, impossible that they would also be um, able to provide it in, in the up direction in case there's a so shortage. They just curtail their generation a little bit in order to be able to participate in the ancillary services uh, market as well. Of course, that uh, uh, kind of assumes that we have enough renewable generation in the system to, to be able to afford that, but I think it's a possibility in the future. Thank you. Uh, Domantas had a question. Thank you. Uh, Domantas Kriages, Minister of Energy of Lithuania. I'm holding the program here because uh, I would actually like the panelists to ask one question. One question of the session, because mm -hmm. the first question is, um, of the session is the results and achievements, which you have well, very well explained. Thank you. And the second question is, what has the Baltic Nordic co co collaboration added to your work? So basically, my question is, uh, uh, having in mind the projects you were working on, it's a question for everyone, uh, would you have worked on these questions in, in any case? Or whether this program has in a way inspired you to look exactly in this direction? Or maybe you have spent your time on some, something else. So is there, was there an added value, especially from the topics of, of this program? What, what do you think? Okay, would you like to start? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not a big deal. Uh, as for me, I was working on a more or less related uh, topics and problems for earlier times and like through my master and blah, blah, blah. 
So um, I have found this program to help me to increase my knowledge, not just, uh, you know, I found this program to change the direction or whatever. So firstly, I was working on topic and then I have found a program. Like it was like that for me. Mm. Anna? For us, uh, for our consortium, this consortium was possible only due to this program. And uh, as I told during my presentation that Xing uh, Zhang from uh, Dalarna University, he just, uh, he, as I understand, he got to know about this program and he just think, okay, there are Baltic states that we, and we should find some partners. And, uh, and uh, actually these consortium, so we did not have any networking before. But uh, later, for sure, I invited people from, from my previous consortiums, but this connection between uh, Nordic country research organization and Baltic country research organization was possible only due to, to, this, uh, to this program. And uh, for sure, yes, district heating topic was in the focus of our interest, but this, uh, as I told too, this uh, fifth generation district heating, we were not sure if we have to, if we have to investigate it more, but uh, during this project already there are more and more discussions about, okay, let's replace fourth generation by fifth generation because it is very um, interesting and uh, attractive, attractive title, yes, as 5G and 4G, just <laughs> like to compare it, yes, with internet, okay. And uh, I'm very glad that due to this project, at least we have these scientific basis as something to have more knowledge, to be more clever for our ministries, for authorities, for us. So uh, absolutely due to this, uh, uh, this uh, project, it is possible and we already, we have this, uh, we will have this report, papers and so on to be, to have more knowledge in it. And now we, we know what we are talking about and we know about perspectives. So in our case, definitely it is just due to, to this great program. Yeah, Tommy, you raised your hand as well. For us, this program definitely increased the collaboration with the Baltic countries and it increased the, our knowledge about the region because when the power markets and the energy systems are integrating more and more, it's, it's extremely important to have the regional perspective and uh, we've done several studies about the Nordic countries and the Baltic countries. And uh, it, it's very nice to continue this work and to answer the most recent challenges. But also it, it's very crucial that we have the collaboration to build the data and the tools to actually analyze the larger region. So without these projects, we wouldn't have the knowledge about the Baltic region like we do now. And that would severely limit our abilities to analyze the like the larger area, like including all Nordic countries, all Baltic countries, Poland and Germany, and so the whole Baltic Sea region. And uh, this has been an excellent uh, collaboration and a program to, to build up the knowledge. Yeah, I, I personally have had uh, the chance to, to participate in, in, in quite a few Nordic energy research pro projects already. And I think generally this, this has been a fantastic experience. Uh, I, I spent uh, some years ago, half, half a year in, in, in Technical University of Denmark in, in one of these projects. And um, it, it really gave me a, a lot, of, lot of depth to my analysis because um, well, I, I think the Nordic universities are quite large compared to ours, especially uh, GTU who has a lot of emphasis on uh, energy analysis and, and uh, uh, wind, uh, wind integration. And uh, well, I, uh, that's at least my perspective that it's, it's it, the energy analysis in, in Estonia um, does not have uh, so many people. We're not able to be so specialized. So being introduced to uh, uh, to to the good Danish colleagues gave me a lot of insight into very important details that I didn't know before. For example, in the Balta project, uh, the the whole analysis about the the wind resource and the very detailed wake 
uh, weight losses. I think I could call this a learning experience on, on wind power for, for me as well. Uh, so I, I, I think for me it has been uh, getting to know some of the details, but, but very important details. But I, I, I think as, as more general, uh, I don't know what's the impact of this, but I feel like getting, getting to know all the great people in, in the Nordic countries, it's feel, it feels that we are somehow this, 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 this one energy community around the Baltic Sea, and it makes, in my head, the, the cooperation more feasible or, or, or possible. We have these joint projects, uh, maybe that's also an inspiration for the policymakers. Thank you. We had one more question somewhere around here. Yeah? Uh, hi, all. My name is Reynad. I'm a postdoc researcher from Taltec. So this is something which come to my mind while listening to the previous sessions. So uh, I think in Baltic Sea as well as maybe in uh, in all the seas, there is an option to create energy islands, which uh, not only focus on the wind, offshore wind, which can also be integrated with the uh, floating PV and maybe battery solutions, so that uh, it will be more sustainable and more energy reliable. So I would like to hear from the experts that uh, what will be the feasibility or like what is your thoughts on developing energy islands uh, in Baltic Sea? That one was yes. for Hardy. Yeah, I, I think a, a, a very broad question, although a good one again. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah how, how do we d define energy islands? We, in, in our various projects, we have considered uh, very many options. Um, so j just, just to go into a little bit more details, as, as an uh, offshore hub, we usually understand that we, we construct somehow a platform to, to which we connect maybe some uh, uh, wind parks and maybe on the platform there's a transformer, but why not also an electrolyzer or, or I think as you said, PV panels. Yeah, so it's, there's, there's actually quite a lot of questions here. Should we build an interconnector to the mainland or maybe even a hydrogen pipeline? Um, and, and I think all, all of this is, is a possibility. And I think uh, uh, maybe not, not related to the projects that I have been part of, but I, I know that there's an initiative called, I think, the European Hydrogen Backbone, where they are looking at maybe it makes sense to generate a lot of hydrogen in the Baltic Sea and deliver it to Central Europe via some kind of central pipeline. Um, why not? Thank you. Ilza Garoza, Norwegian Chamber of Commerce in Latvia. I have a question about applicability of your research findings. So there is a race for uh, to increase energy independence right now. A uh, lot of technology is available. Uh, would you see and advise investors and policymakers to start investing right away or you see there's a need for more research and modeling to be de uh, made so coming back from like a startup community move fast and break things or you would advise a different approach to the topic maybe, yes maybe i will start with our fifth generation district heating and cooling actually um, results have been have shown as i told that due to last year policy it we need uh, at least uh, 10 15 years uh, just for active implementation of this uh, technology because of current situation of current high share of new just installed uh, biomass boilers uh, but uh, we should be prepared and we should make investigation of uh, ultra low and non-traditional heat sources uh, for when district heating from our side. Anyone else? Tommy? Uh, we could classify these technologies or solutions in few groups. One, one group is already like happening fast. For example, the wind and solar power investments, as Hardy said in his presentation, the market is already in a way overheated and it's fully booked. 
So even if somebody would want to invest more, there would be nobody to supply more, unless we wait for several years when, for, for example, the uh, European offshore you need wind power. So you need special ships to do the offshore installations. And those ships are booked for a few years already now ahead. And uh, same with solar PV. So w we do see increasing solar PV prices in Finland because people want to install it so much. And uh, then we have a following group of technologies that will be economically feasible in a few years if, if it's not already easy. So for example, electric vehicles. Uh, the government can speed up the development like the Norwegian government has done. But then you have governments who have not reacted that fast and the technology might become commercial and profitable without the government. Uh, but then you have few technologies like lacking behind in, in that kind of a development tract. Uh, they would need a boost there. So that's, that's kind of something where the governments could push these technologies to become commercial earlier. And uh, maybe that's, that's my answer in short. But uh, it, it's very important to acknowledge that each technology belongs to this kind of a different group that should be treated differently. Thank you. We had one more question, Harris. Thank you. I would like to ask a question maybe for all of you, like leaders of, the, of different projects. So you led different projects, you analyzed different problems. Something was solved, something is still not. So my question would be, what uh, like, few, like future research, uh, uh, say options or directions, you would, uh, would see, would you, rec you would recommend for maybe future, mm -hmm. future projects for this pro program or uh, or, uh, or a broader pro problem. So what are future research areas according to uh, your point of view? Thank you. So maybe we should start with uh, you, Ernst. For me, it's an interesting question because I'm not the leader of a some research group or whatever. So um, I personally, now actively working with uh, uh, plasma assisted combustion and a possibility not only to build new resources of heat or whatever, but also the main goal of us is to uh, restore and renew already existing, like for example, steam generators and water heating boilers to convert them from usage of natural gas uh, into the usage of gases from a reserve group. For example, like tail biogas and so on, which are not that like easily flammable without additional treatment. Uh, so, like, I personally work on this thematic now, and I see that there could be a, a big profit because uh, to build a power station would require much more time than to just you know uh, change the. Um, let's say burners, the layout of uh, just some constructional units there, but that would not require from you to completely rebuild the firebox to reinstall all the tubings and so on. So from my point of view, uh, we should also concentrate not only into investing to the completely new, but also trying to, yeah, it is like, part-time solution, but we now need to close the holes in our energy budget and somehow to uh, provide a possibility for already existing equipment to stay for a bit longer until the new technology would come. Because by now we are sitting in such situation when we are not able to use already existing equipment that consumes the natural gas because of a lack of natural gas, a possible lack, let's say, yeah. and. Uh, but we still got the same consumption of electricity and heat energy, so we need to do that. And uh, it is such a, you know, like scissors, and we need somehow to get between those like blades of those scissors. So kind of like that, yeah. yeah. Anna. Yes, maybe I 
will comment a little bit regarding what you mentioned because uh, it is not related to, to our scientific work or research, but actually, yes, we face the same situation regarding lack of gas and uh, district heating too. And then uh, many of our um, of district heating operators had to go back to shale uh, oil it is all produced from oil shale, fossil fuel, and they had to use existing technologies to produce for this short period uh, to cover, but to be independent, to cover these uh, peak uh, heat loads by, by shale oil, which is not very good in the term of, of climate. Uh, uh, problems, but uh, but it it just when you don't have any choice. Uh, so we, due to this fact, it was possible to reject uh, Russian natural gas. But uh, speaking about uh, future projects and future research, answering your question, actually all, we already participate this time as partners in two ongoing projects, uh, which will be presented later. One of it is hard to reach. Uh, consumers and another one about waste heat and both of them are very important this topic should be investigated more and it is very good uh, when I looked uh, the aims of um, Baltic Nordic um, energy research prog project program I understood that uh, you have four of them and actually what what can be seen just looking from the side that this transport uh, topic is not covered by uh, joint research uh, projects I thought absolutely not covered but now today I have heard that you mentioned one slide was dedicated to, to transport topic but this topic okay it is not my field maybe I am a researcher would be interested more more about heating but actually if I see the end to be more um, complex to take all factors into account so this transport topic for sure and uh, another uh, topic or how to field, actually we have different directions for development. So we have nearly energy zero building, we can individual heating solution, we have biomass uh, uh, boilers, uh, we have uh, low temperature heat sources and uh, in the sense of, of heating. And actually there are rather many situations when these technologies start to compete and it is a real problem, yes, how, how to choose and how to do better to one technology but still allow another one and, and we all understand that it will be, it, there will not be such future that we will have, I don't know, one boiler uh, and pipe and that's it. It will be complex, complex system. And to find this balance to get this optimization would be one of the main tasks to and for policy recommendation uh, not to be I don't know over not to have over subsidizing or somehow just uh, to to support one sector and this will uh, will not give possibility to another another future technologies to to develop but it is really complex I don't know it should be a very strong consortium with many many different from many different fields not only heating or power, we have to be together. <laughs> Not only among <coughs> countries, but among sectors too. Yes. Yeah, Hardy. Uh, yeah, so I, I would highlight perhaps two, two topics, and uh, these, these topics kind of emerge on, on a practical term. In, in, in the Balta project, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, we included uh, some kind of representation in the, in the hydrog of hydrogen, which was, I think, uh, on an adequate um, adequate level of detail uh, according to, to what we were analyzing. But I, I think it, it could be done in, in, a, in a more detailed way and as, as was emerged from one of the questions from the audience that you know, offshore hubs based on, on hydrogen um, that could be uh, uh, one of the topics to, to investigate. But I, I think in general detail there's always a lot of work to be done uh, if we have observed how, how Balmoral, for example, has evolved, it, it started off as a model for electricity and district heating generation. But over time, 
we've seen that more and more sectors become relevant. Now there's energy storage and district heating. Uh, we have power to heat. Uh, we have added hydrogen. There's now transport, uh, transport fuels. I think it's it's kind of an, an everlasting process, and it, it as and the model evolves as it, as it becomes more relevant in the in the society and the energy system. We have more coupling, and and we need more accurate representation in the model, uh, kind of continuously. So I think it's 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 a long process, uh, and and we can always do it more accurately and, and more uh, space to improve. Tommy. I would also highlight the sectoral integration for exact same reasons we heard. And in addition to the sectoral integration, we are seeing much greater integration between the European countries and larger regions. So, so far we've been studying, like here, we're speaking with Baltic region, and then we've had a separate large project about the Nordic region. But perhaps in, in future we could have this kind of a Baltic Sea region project, including analysis also from the Poland, Germany, France, UK, because we have and will have strong electricity connections to those countries and their electricity demand is driving also the electricity prices in Nordic and Baltic countries. And uh, we, we do study these policy measures as the region alone, but uh, in reality, for example, the German energy policy choices have a heavy impact on the both Nordic and Baltic countries. And, uh, when looking at this kind of a long-term developments, it's really important to look a bigger region. So I, have a, so I have a question as well, and Anna will be talking about this in the next session, so this will be for the three others. And that is, as uh, researchers, uh, and in hindsight, what would you change about the program? What, what would you have done differently? Or what could we have done differently? As, as one audience question was, we should have and could have had more cooperation with the Baltic ministries to mm. discuss, for example, like it would have been quite easy to adjust the list of studied policy measures or adjust the list of studied indicators. And uh, if we had had more, like we did, we, we had almost more than five discussions with the Baltic ministries in the telcos. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we could have had more to, to make those lists more relevant and introduce our results even more and discuss, like have more interaction there. How do you? Quite a difficult question, but I, I think perhaps uh, what, what uh, Tommy highlighted would, would be quite a good idea. Um, maybe in, in the projects that I was included in, perhaps additional communication with uh, with the ministries, with the stakeholders, would have been uh, quite a good idea. Um, maybe even if, if I reflect on, on the Baltap project more specifically, uh, in the project application we somehow established that, uh, that the regional TSOs would be the, the core um, contact or, or feedback group, uh, perhaps uh, inclusion of the ministries in that group would have been more beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it seems to be the hardest question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like I got no troubles with these projects, and like uh, all the profits I've got they are only profits, you know, only positive sides, at least for me, from my point of view, yeah. I was not that, like, uh, uh, interacting with this project too deep, maybe to see some uh, minuses and to have some, like, you know, the decisions, but from my point of view, yeah, what you could say, everything was fine. I think that's a quite positive note, and I think we might uh, take that with us and uh, get ready for lunch. So thank you, everyone. We'll also have, we also have a couple of uh, gifts for you that took place in this panel. So thank you for coming and for participating. Um,
Great, and also thanks to the audience for asking very relevant and good questions as well. And we'll uh, meet back here at half past, one. half past one. So we have a good one and a half hour break. Um, Marika will help us to get to the lunch place. And then afterwards, when we return, I hope to see a lot of good discussions in front of the posters uh, as well. So thank you.
So, ladies and gentlemen, I suggest uh, we continue our conference. You've had your lunch, I hope, and also had time to have some coffee. So, very good. Uh, well, I now have the difficult task to replace Kevin as a moderator for uh, the, se the coming session of, of this conference. Uh, we'll do my best. Uh, my name is Stefan Eriksson. Uh, I'm the director of the Nordic Council of Ministers' Office here in Latvia. That's our light box over there. We're not in the middle of this, but we are supportive of this very much. Uh, our job is to support and promote Nordic-Baltic cooperation. Uh, we've done that since 1991. I think uh, Klaus should even mention that. Last year we celebrated 30 years uh, of our office uh, in Latvia. Uh, and uh, we are very much fond of this project. I came here five years ago, so I was here from the very start uh, uh, when uh, discussions started on, on this program. Uh, uh, and I think we shall be very grateful to the visionaries from Nordic uh, Energy Resource, but also the Baltic counterparts, that uh, uh, this program was agreed upon. It has turned out, as, we, as has been said, uh, it comes very timely. But for, for me, it's also uh, a very good model of Nordic-Baltic cooperation where we have a mutual interest and we can join forces, join resources, uh, uh, and create something good for, for the whole region. So, uh, session two. Uh, we have listened to, uh, uh, during session one, uh, to uh, some of the project leaders. Uh, this session, uh, we will uh, focus on what the funding parties that is the Nordic Energy Research and the, uh, the Baltic Ministries have gained from this program. So we will have four short presentations held by each of the funding parties and then also two presentations by uh, two project leaders. Uh, we will also have a, a, a coffee break uh, somewhere around uh, 2.30. We will see how things develop. Um, so uh, the first part, uh, full presentation, as I said, also a, a mutual question uh, to, to each uh, uh, presenter. Uh, and uh, those presenters will be head of strategic planning energy department at the Ministry of Evo Economic Affairs and Communications uh, uh, in Estonia. This is Iria Mölder. I will soon give you the floor. It, she will be followed by Director of the Department of Sustainable Energy Policy at the Ministry of Economics of the Republic of Latvia, Dr. Dimitris uh, Skoroks, whom you already know. Uh, then uh, the advisor in the en Innovation Group at the Ministry of Energy of the Republic of Lithuania, Mr. Daumantas Keresis. And lastly, um, uh, the Head of Nordic Energy Research, Dr. Klaus Schütte, whom you've also seen already today. So, uh, the funding parties will elaborate on uh, what they expected to gain from the program, uh, what we are getting short-term, long-term results, and uh, are we getting the policy recommendations that we need. Uh, yeah, so first uh, I will introduce um, Mrs. Möldre from Estonia. Uh, she has dealt with comprehensive planning, environmental management and impact assessment since 2006 holds a Master's in Environmental Science and Policies from Central European University. At her free time, enjoys, she enjoys outdoor activities such as skiing, skating and cycling, and is also interested in culture. So, please, the floor is yours. So good afternoon from Estonia and I am very happy to say you that I was actually there when, when the Memorandum of Understanding was signed by Estonia by Mrs. Kadri Simpson and between uh, uh, head of uh, Nordic Energy uh, Research, Mr. Koch, so I was actually there and I am very uh, happy and proud to be here today with you. 
it has been uh, quite a long process these four years and I see that uh, it has already so good uh, results when we are here today. So, but I decided today uh, uh, use the opportunity and uh, talk about the Estonian situation, how, how the research and the work you are doing is important for us. Uh, first, <laughs> try to move it. Uh, ah, it's moving there, sorry. <laughs> I didn't see it's moving because in front of me it's the same. Okay. Um, at the moment, we are in the process already one year to prepare for a green transition action plan for Estonia. And it's a kind of so, so, society, society wide uh, process. Uh, everybody are uh, almost uh, engaged there, so we hope to have it in the end of December uh, action plan for green transition. And I see that energy transition is a very big par part of it, so they rely on us and to all of you in this sense. Uh, generally, Estonia is uh, doing quite uh, well. <laughs> Estonia is a uh, tent in, in general sustainability. Our things are, how to say, very good. If I, if I show you the, the, the rankings. And we measure our success in uh, energy field, in energy sustainability index uh, by uh, World Energy Council, Trilemma Index. And as you see, all Baltics and Nordics are the very top of uh, global uh, activities in energy. So uh, we are really, in this sense, uh, leaders. Although Estonia could be with Latvia in better position, but I'm <laughs> sure that in the coming future, uh, the, the position will improve. Uh, we like to measure ourselves because we have been long time shown as a very dirty country with our oil shale. And that's why we always show that it's not so bad, as you all tell us, that, uh, that we really work uh, to replace soil shale, to, to get better habits and uh, uh, actions towards environment and, uh, and climate. So our, our positions in Europe are not uh, so bad, but as you see in the electricity, really we have to uh, put our forces, and that's why our minister before said that they decided that in 2030 we have all renewables in electricity. Uh, filling uh, national energy and climate plan, we are on track, but as you know, next uh, year we have to show uh, adjusted plan, new plan for energy and climate. Uh, we are starting to prepare the next, uh, next plan uh, soon after we have uh, finalized the reporting of the present plan for European Commission in the March. So after March we are able to make more serious work for our new plan. But the existing uh, <laughs> so bad, I don't see this anymore here. <laughs> Existing plan we have uh, until 2030, and if, uh, if I may say, we couldn't make it uh, without Nordics, because at that time we also, uh, already used a lot of uh, modeling, uh, preparing the national uh, development plan for energy sector, and we had, for example, Danish uh, Energy Agency modeling for us uh, with Palmorel uh, our uh, scenarios for, uh, for uh, electricity. And in total, uh, uh, taking into account all uh, energy sectors, we had like the 135 scenarios for Estonia, uh, different combinations. But uh, if you took into account all sorts of uh, requirements, uh, legal and uh, international uh, norms, then, then only 15 of them were, were acceptable. So we have long uh, traditions of using scientific base and modeling in our uh, national uh, de <coughs> de development. So all the uh, important keywords what have been today uh, talked, they, they are all included in our uh, future planning and we try to be on track in, in every sense.
And uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Along with the uh, with the present plan, we had a separate plan for uh, for research and uh, development uh, with uh, 400,000 euros for year to make uh, uh, may, to make uh, so all sorts of investigations and analyses. And among that money, we had also. Uh, one quarter of it uh, went for this, this program. So, uh, last four years, in this sense, we have been in very privileged uh, position in Estonia because no other sector, I suppose, ha don't have any such a specific uh, development plan. But we were really neat on that. So, mostly these analyses we are during, uh, during uh, to the program are for uh, preparing regulation and, uh, and policy making and uh, they are really in, um, in uh, very different subjects which are uh, present uh, needed. And uh, speci specifically we share our information uh, in our uh, unofficial web page, energiatalgu.ee, it's the last uh, line where we put all the all the main results or and all <coughs> all energy late, related issues to share uh, more uh, broader knowledge uh, to our uh, no all stakeholders and uh, interested interested uh, parties. Uh, what uh, has this, uh, this program given to us? It has given all new knowledge is in very in important and our uh, general development related issues. And I asked also feedback from our scientists who have participated in the program. So I see that without them, uh, we wouldn't have the, the state development plan as, as we have and uh, they co contribute as very important content to, to make better choices in the future. In this sense, um, scientists kind of resp uh, are responsible also about the development plan we, we bring, out, bring and work on. Uh, how we use results from the program? Uh, as I said, we have been uh, already long time based on scientific knowledge and modeling, and it may seem time to time that maybe maybe the connection between ministries and the scientific institutions is so not so strong. Yes, it's not every day, but we try to keep uh, the connection, and very often we go back to the university. Please help us out, and we make uh, also one two. T uh, times per year, at least uh, meetings for uh, for um, our scientists and also energy consultants uh, to work on the most uh, important issues. So we really hope that in the future, when the future projects coming out from the program, they they take it into account that actually they give us. Um, so important Im information, we, we, rely, we rely, rely on them and they are in, no, res in responsible on the, on the future. So it is not only about the policy making, but it is also a question of making right decisions for the future. For example, in the uh, study where what we were uh, holding this uh, this year with the help of European Commission money on climate neutral el electricity, uh, there we have now seven scenarios and how do how do you pick up the the best or the the right one? Then we need uh, uh, let's say the uh, independent scientific uh, uh, view on that as well. So from my side all, I, I really hope that uh, all the coming projects, they, they take into account that uh, we need those results desperately and as soon as possible. <laughs> so good luck with that. Thank you. Uh -huh. okay. If you just stay, st uh, thank you so much, Iria. We will have a question around the joint uh, a bit later, but one question, if you would name I mean, one pressing issue where, where research and, and researcher could really uh, address uh, uh, to, to, to the help of a ministry, what would you? 
one mentioned. subject. Though. Yeah, I mean, the most pressing issue where, where really, you know, research could be uh, of help for you. At the moment, uh, we talk about a lot about energy uh, adequacy mm. that we, in the present situation especially. Okay, but, uh, thank you. Yeah. Please. So, uh, we continue. Uh, with Latvia, and uh, I'm about to give the floor to uh, Mr. Dimitris Skorux, uh, Doctor of Economic Sciences, Experience Manager, uh, Professional Economist, years of experience in the public sector, in the public sector of Latvia, and also in other EU member states. Has headed departments, led multicultural teams, uh, delivered excellence in the fields of macroeconomics, public policy, competition law, international economy, EU cooperation, and energy re regulations. I have no information what you do in your leisure time, Dimitris. You probably don't have much of it, but Unfortunately so. my, my <laughs> guess would be, though, after having listened to you, maybe you have an interest for, for history, maybe even culture, and some philosophy. That's my guess, a wild guess. And good wine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> please, the floor is yours. Good day again, ladies and gentlemen, on this magnificent, if a bit cloudy, afternoon here in Riga. I do believe that events like this, uh, the exchange of ideas and different perspectives which we are sharing today, are pivotal to ensuring a just transition of any kind, uh, even more so in the fields of energy, financial and social sustainability, which would shape the way our society functions in a democratic yet inclusive fashion for years to come. In order to, uh, in a sense, reinforce my statement, I'd like to share with you a little bit of information on the Latvian perspective. Uh, even I would even go so far as to narrow it a little bit uh, to the Latvian civil service perspective on the program. And uh, from that standing point, I would be able to uh, deliver on the initial question of what has been achieved and in what way has that been brought forward. So in order to do that, one would need to start from the very beginning, which would make sense. And that beginning uh, is traced back to 2020 when the National Energy and Climate Plan had been put together. And I'm deliberately using uh, the term of put together and it was less science-based at the time and more politics-driven, not policy, politics-driven, and that is of essence. So the plan was adopted in February 2021 based on the data from 2020, and uh, half year down the line, the Fit for 55 package, uh, in a sense, hit the country in the face, uh, stating that while the goals which have been set are not ambitious enough, and that a throughout revision of the plan needs to take place. Come this year, the Russian war escalates and Repower EU induces additional higher goals of the plan to be revised in the future. And from that standing point, it uh, was immediately clear that a science-based approach is pivotal to establishing a goal set which is not only sustainable and fairly ambitious, but achievable considering the current state of affairs. And that state of affairs, well, in a sense, brings us to a realization that retrospective is also a thing, much like the physical reality by which we are all bound. So if we would look at the Latvian energy mix back in 2020, one would immediately <coughs> notice two underlying issues from a climate change perspective. First and foremost, that's the transportation sector, which consumes the lion's share of fossils here within the country. And secondly, is the dependence on natural gas, which is a dual matter for one reason and one reason alone. Natural gas is the least polluting fossil, as they sometimes call it. I mean, we do not have coal in the country. We do not uh, utilize lignite as our northern neighbors in Estonia. And from that perspective, we would have, and still are, by the way, heavily dependent on natural gas as a source of, first and foremost, heat, and secondly, balancing electricity. And when one 
brings up the topic of electricity here in Latvia. Uh, there are two issues, again, two issues, which emanate from the configuration of the national generation capacity set. First and foremost, uh, we are strong in renewables in general, and electricity generation sector is a manifestation of that embedded sustainability. I mean, hydropower and biomass play a vital role here. And natural gas is the only fossil used for producing electricity here within the country. So from that standing point, again, the issue is that on one hand, we're stuck with the least polluting fossil, and on the other hand, it's still a fossil, and it, until this year, ladies and gentlemen, was a uh, Russia originating fossil, which of course is an issue in itself. So from that standing point, the uh, current configuration of the National Energy and Climate Plan uh, was not sustainable on any level, both in the ECG uh, paradigm or the general philosophy of uh, advancing forward as an open market prosperous economy. So a revision of that plan would need to take place and different scientific institutions have been contributing to the analytical background or the analytical evaluations behind the revisions taking place. Uh, I also have an academic background, and for better or for worse, well, which uh, from my standing point is the bane of my existence, uh, I kind of tend to question a lot of embedded choices. So from that perspective, uh, I do know that each and every scientist has its own way of doing things, and the assumptions are deeply embedded within well, the confine of the uh, analytical or economical philosophical school from which that particular scientist is emanating. And that means that uh, for better or for worse, again, it's always plausible to challenge assumptions and to have different points of view. Those points of view may be even conflicting as long as they're robust and analytically sound. And that is where policy comes to be. That is where choices need to be made. So, on top of all that, the program comes into perspective and the program had contributed immensely to understanding what type of endeavors could have been undertaken. We've uh, revised our attitude to hydroelectric power generation and our hydro resources are now viewed as a potential storage facility rather than just a means of generation, uh, to give you an example. And by way of another example, we always thought that solar panels were the, the solution to district heating. Well, as research showed us, that was not the case considering our latitude and our geography. From my personal perspective, and this is not an official position of the ministry, but I do speak from the bottom of my heart. The most important bonus that uh, manifested itself over the course of uh, program development is the truly deep and elaborate type of engagement we have with our counterparties and their colleagues. I do think that the greatest benefit which we reaped, and it was mutual from the program, is the sense of camaraderie, is the sense of mutual support and a sense of European unity, which was delivered by the researchers. And from that standing point, ladies and gentlemen, the biggest bonus of the program is, well, the fruit of it all, our cooperative effort, which paves the way towards a policy decision paradigm, which is both facts and respect-based, and that is important. Yet, of course, there is the purely technical or scientific dimension of it all. The program did confirm, uh, much in line with what other um, research undertakings had proven to be true, that offshore wind generation capacities combined with onshore capabilities and photovoltaics, uh, which are, the latter are, the stuff distributed in a uh, decentralized fashion uh, to convert consumers to prosumers. So that would be our future at the foreseeable 20 to 25 years. This is the strategic goal to which the country should start working towards as of yesterday, and I do mean that we're a little bit lagging behind uh, all of the issues which uh, are manifesting in a way which uh, well, I'll, I'll just be blunt and non-diplomatic here. We needed to adapt this plan earlier, and we needed to change the way of thinking earlier. Yet, 
La later doesn't mean lost. So from that perspective, we are commencing forward with our partners. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the best outcome of this program yet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitri. I'll ask the same question to you. What would be the most uh, pressing issue that research could address for the Ministry? That's an easy one. We need to formalize the review of the National Energy and Climate Plan by 2023. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, we're heading further south to Lithuania. Uh, Daumantas Keresis, yeah, uh, uh, who uh, holds a master's uh, in international affairs and diplomacy, 15 years of experience with global and uh, European Union energy affairs, international energy research and innovations, uh, and also national strategy, strate strategic energy planning. For the last 12 years, he has worked at the Ministry of Energy in Lithuania as an advisor at the Innovation Group. Uh, besides focusing on energy policy, he's a passionate traveler and an enthusiast of electronic dance mu music. Wow, the floor is yours. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. And I'm really happy to see the full room even after the lunch break because it tends to be that half of the audience is gone in many conferences, but today you are here. So thank you for that and for listening on. And um, yeah, I'll just uh, go through the needs and deeds for this program, needs for the, for the ministry, energy ministry of Lithuania, and whether there were deeds that were covered, that were made to cover those needs. And actually, um, this program was initially planned to be held uh, like two years ago, like a middle event of the program. But uh, due to well-known um, uh, situation, pandemics, we had to postpone. But I think it went to the, for, the bet for the better. Now we have even more results to discuss about, even more of you to gather here in the room. So I think it went all for the, for the best. Uh, so let's move let's, um, on. Yeah, so about the gains. We, as a ministry, what is the main, main interest for us is to, to, to have the science for policy advice, because as a ministry, yes, we, we plan, we, uh, political ambitions are being, being set, but whether in any case these ambitions could be met, uh, we really appreciate the scientific advice here and, and, and uh, well, to test these, and I already heard some of, uh, quite a number actually of, of advice today, so thank you for that, so I'm bringing that, that home. Uh, but of course, it's not only this, it's not only this, we look in a, in a, in a better, in a wider perspective, and uh, yeah, so one of these additional options is about tackling the important issues for this region and important topics. They were, um, they were presented before, but such, such things as decarbonization of transport, uh, energy efficiency and, and the like were important, are important, and will be important in the future. So we and we also really appreciate the um, uh, comments, like from Nordic Baltic perspective, on this. Uh, yeah, so this one is connected to the science of policy advice. It's about testing, scientifically proving whether the plans are really possible to achieve in, in technical terms. Just cross-checking. Uh, more cooperation. We believe that it could be uh, uh, more active. That's why we believe in such programs and we try to finance it so to, to enhance cooperation between researchers, students, academia, and public and private sector among Baltic states and Nordic Baltic states. And we are happy that it's actually happening. And finally, I would say it's like a building of a community. And uh, yeah, I do see a community here today, and I saw it yesterday evening. So really happy that you came. And such a, such an event wouldn't be wouldn't be possible like a year ago or so. So it uh, would be only online one. So I'm happy that some a community has been formed already. So so are we getting results? Are we getting what we expected to? Uh, let me give, begin with so, three very specific reports. I think they have not been mentioned here today, but uh, it's also part of the program. They're like a short, rather short-term uh, uh, topics, so short-term reports for around one year. And the first one was, was about transport statistics. And so well, transport decarbonization is a challenge in Lithuania. It's really 
we are not not getting not not achieving the targets we set so far. So we this report was one of one of the examples that that uh, uh, suggested suggested the possible alternatives and alternative fuels other transportation modes and. Uh, it's not only, of course, not only the um, uh, work of the Ministry of Energy in our country, it's also the Ministry of Transport and others involved. But still, this, the findings helped us. See, in, and in the ministry, uh, Energy Ministry, we also formed a special like a policy management group for electrification. So these results are really used uh, directly by, by us. Another one was about the heat pump potential in the Baltic states. It was really, really well accepted by our professionals at the ministry. Um, in terms of quality, because now in Lithuania, in heating sec sec sector, especially in central heating, most of it is being um, uh, uh, covered by biomass, 70% and more. But what about the future? I think it won't be all the time like this. We need to think about uh, what will happen, what will be changed, how biomass will be changed in our case. It's not going back to gas, like natural gas, so what about next? So uh, this will be also taken on board by our heating planning professionals who will look in, into studies like this and, and plan the future. What's, how will we uh, heat ourselves in the future? And the third one is what about uh, technology cooperation, technology um, choices. So I would, I would say um, the, um, the results were mainly twofold. So one fold, this study has uh, suggest that the common Baltic Nordic um, energy technology cooperation topics for now and for, for the future. And on the other hand, it also suggested country by country um, which technologies we could um, uh, co uh, concentrate on. And we also, have, uh, we also hope that this study will um, help us in, in um, defining our further cooperation topics like the, for, for, for Baltic and Nordic countries. Yeah, and so we are we also, and it, this study also helped us to choose the, the, the topics for um, uh, Horizon Europe's program and also will help for the international energy agencies, uh, the, um, technologists to choose which we as a country could, could you know, um, concentrate more. And uh, now going to the research projects, just before going on, let me see just a couple of things here. Uh, we are, of course, aware about all the projects which are being, being conducted. I have looked all of them through. But here in this slide, I will show only the ones which are already finished, because the question is about the outcomes and how these outcomes um, help us. So that's why only three of them will be mentioned here, not forgetting another one. Um, and even for those projects, we got the results like two weeks ago and so, so it will be not a very deep dive in the, um, in the topic, but like an uh, impression of um, general recommendations, what, what, we, what we found. And mobility projects will not be touched here as well, because we see the, uh, the uh, outcomes of these, well, mostly for the students, for the researchers, but not very directly for the ministry policy making. So the first one of fast and the context were already presented today about it and uh, well generally speaking what are the outcomes of the minister's work every day like what are the outcomes which that we can you know touch so at the end of the day it's like strategic planning and law making I mean some documents so when I see um, a project about um, scenarios so I instantly think about some kind of uh, strategic planning document. And um, yeah, we did have, um, we did have planning uh, and, and modeling uh, projects before. It's not the first one, but I think it's really needed to redo this modeling time after time because you know, conditions change, a year go by. As this year has also shown us the uh, fluctuation in prices and um, this is needed to be redone. So the outcomes of this project will definitely be um, considered in our updated energy policy general documents. Next slide will just show what I mean, but um, what I hear today, it will be really useful for us to, 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 um, to plan our energy policy, or renew our energy policy. Uh, energy sufficiency, it's actually a very interesting concept for us, because yeah, we, um, we are used to be planning energy efficiency. 
And, and we are used to think about uh, renewables, but energy sufficiency is like uh, one more axis. It's like X, Y, and Z, you know, sufficiency. So it's also connected with modeling. I understand it's part of the uh, energy planning modeling. So in connection with other uh, projects, the results will be considered in, in the, for example, national energy, energy, uh, national energy strategy update and other such documents. So this is really important topic and will take time to uh, like dive deeper in, into, into what was, has been found here. And uh, buildings, near zero emission buildings, it's, well, for us, it's really uh, important in terms of energy efficiency, general energy efficiency, as uh, buildings tend to, um, to, to consume a lot of, a lot of uh, energy. Building design is not really, uh, in our case, not the work of energy ministry, but it is really the work of the environment ministry. And we, of course, will share the results with, with them. And, uh, and maybe there is a hint for further planning purposes in terms of planning uh, to try to assume how much of such kind of buildings will be built in the future. If there is a lot of buildings as such, then of course we'll not need much uh, less energy. Uh, so, and getting to my, my uh, examples. So the first uh, thing I got in mind is about national energy strategy. For us, this document was issued, the last, um, the last um, update was made in 2018. And for us, it's every five years, it should be renewed. Well, it's for quite natural reasons due to the evolution of, of, of um, energy and, and economy. And next year, they will say, I foresee there will be some, some um, planning started to update this document. And the research results will be really useful advice for this over, overarching document in, in the famous energy. Uh, you have seen uh, such a document, but maybe different cover for today. It's about national energy climate plans. It's every EU country has those. And um, next year is the time to update them. Again, so all the results will be useful for us. It's a multidimensional um, uh, planning document, including research innovation part. And we have an ambition to, to uh, strengthen this part a lot. And um, this program is, is helping us to do that. And it's just an, uh, so far an ambition for us uh, about the, I mentioned about this an energy technology choice document. So, um, so some advices. So we hope that it will be not only advice for some maybe financing programs, but maybe, maybe we will um, get to have such a, a general document about the energy policy, energy technology choices in the country in the future. So uh, that's this by saying that. I thank you for your attention. And um, of course, I know that other projects are ongoing and we'll be really looking forward for the results of those projects. I, I wish you all the luck with them. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your work. Uh, same question to you. The most pressing issue where further research you know, would be needed from your perspective. Yeah, of course, there are many issues, but if I need to choose, choose one, so yeah. uh, I can say maybe offshore wind. There is a lot of offshore wind talk being, being uh, and plans being made. And uh, we know the potential of the Baltic Sea um, region for wind, thanks to the studies. There is ambitions made, how much do we need to achieve, but how? How to achieve? It's you know it's a question of well it's a question to the scientists <laughs> to see if it's possible. So really looking forward for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, now it's time we listen to uh, the Baltic, the Baltics, and now we will listen to the Nordics in one person. Uh, that is uh, Klaus uh, Schütte, who has worked as CEO at Nordic Energy Research since 2019, holds a PhD in economics from Copenhagen University. Uh, uh, this PhD concerned the integration of renewable energy and electricity market designs. Very topical. Previously, he has worked as professor at the Danish Technical University. And besides his uh, professional career, he uh, has an interest for horse riding and diving. A bit surprising. Oh, the floor is yours, Klaus. <laughs> Thank you very much. So be, being the fourth in line uh, after lunch and also after three excellent speakers from, from my dear colleagues in the Baltic countries, 
it's always hard to see if I can, can keep your attention. And actually, at, at this lunch break, we at my table talked about how do you actually keep attention of, of the listener. And we came up that you just need a picture of, of a cute cat because then everybody is looking at it. So here's your cat. <laughs> so I hope I got your intention uh, because all about this uh, having a pet like a cat or anything is, is about feelings. It's about what are your values of, of joining something or having a, a, a pet. And this is also what we t would talk about today is, is what, why are we actually here? What is our perspective of joining a Nordic uh, Baltic uh, corporation like the Joint uh, Energy Research uh, Corporation? So let me start, start by saying who we are and then you get a better understanding of, of who is uh, Nordic Energy Research. As said in, in my welcoming speech this morning, we are an uh, institution under the auspice of the Nordic Council of Ministers. We do three things, uh, mainly if you had to categorize them. One is, is two, that we facilitate the intergovernmental cooperation between the Nordic countries. Uh, for example, by acting as a secretariat for, for various uh, uh, in, um, yeah, governmental uh, working groups, we have one for, for the Nordic electricity market, for example, which is very effective in, in finding common rules for, for how to, to operate the electricity market in an efficient way across borders. And we do other things like, like this. We also uh, facilitate the EU-Nordic uh, cooperation. One of the things that we are doing is that we are call managers for the under rise in Europe. We are call managers for what is called uh, clean energy technology, uh, clean energy transition partnerships, uh, which is uh, open call right now, uh, that we are, uh, are coordinating uh, as a call managers. And then the third thing we're doing, and this is what is important today, is we are funding a joint research and mobility program. So besides this uh, Baltic uh, Nordic cooperation, we also have some pure Nordic uh, pro uh, projects. So example of that is, is we have a uh, research program of Nordic Maritime Transport and Energy Research, where we we finance some consortia working on uh, ammonia for 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 decarbonizing the maritime sectors. Um, we have uh, another program on uh, Nordic hydrogen values as energy hubs, which is open right now. So if someone wants to apply for for hydrogen uh, studies, is is now you have to do it. I think it closed in next week, uh, the end of. of of October, so hurry up if you have not joined yet. Uh, so coming back to, to today, I think uh, having common interests and goals improve the, our cooperation. And, and, and if you look at the Nordic country, we have a vision of becoming the most sustainable and integrated region in the world. And I think this is in very good line with the political target of the Baltics. Because to, together, I think together we can, the Baltic and Nordic country uh, is in a joint, jointly um, in an excellent position to de deploy innovative solutions due to our ambitious energy and, and climate policy goals, which you have just heard from the three previous uh, speakers, as well as our extensive research program. <clears throat> At the same time, we have a strong history in, in, in energy cooperation between the countries, and they actually make us in a, a unique positions. But then, of course, you can ask, can we, a small country, lead the green transition? I would say yes, we can. I mean, all the individual Nordic countries, at least as the, the Baltic states, are relatively small. However, as a region, we cover the northern hemisphere from the Canadian border in the west to the Russian border in, in the east. And actually, as a region, we are the 11th largest economy in the world, making the region comparable with Canada. So we have a mass. We have the critical mass in our research communities and energy sectors that is needed if we join forces and go together. So therefore, for me, it's obvious that we look for joint Baltic Nordic cooperation in that way. If this is nothing new, because if, as I also mentioned in the beginning of, of my welcome speech, we have been working together for the last 30 years or more uh, in Baltic Nordic cooperation. But if you look at, at what actually kind of initiated uh, the present program, in 2015, the Northern Council of Ministers made a strategic review of the Nordic cooperation on energy and how it should develop uh, for the next five or ten years. And actually, if you look at that, there are some very clear recommendations of the Nordic uh, Baltic cooperation. If I just quote one of them, 
it says that the political ambition and roadmap should have a clear focus on the involvement of the Baltic countries, which are a transition area for the Nordic electricity. Strong interconnection will improve energy security across the whole region. Close Nordic Baltic electricity market equation will also strengthen the Nordic Baltic voice within EU. So there you have actually uh, at that time some very strong indication of, 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 of what is actually still relevant. Because not only can we help each other in obtaining climate targets like becoming carbon neutral region, strong Baltic Nordic integration would also improve our energy security across the whole region, an issue that is even more important than ever after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine uh, earlier this year. Now, looking at the cooperation within energy research and common knowledge creation, it does play a crucial role in the green transition. After the oil crisis in the 70s, 80s, the Nordic energy ministers recognized the need for common knowledge foundation and created my institution, Nordic Energy Research. Since then, we have uh, financed cooperative energy research that have added value to national research initiative. The oil crisis, as well as the energy uh, and climate crisis also led to the de development of di disruptive technologies like wind power, efficient district heating infrastructures, as well as closer energy market cooperation in the Nordics. So looking at the history from previous uh, uh, crisis, we can say that the crisis have fostered Nordic solutions that are now implemented globally. And the present energy crisis, I dare to say, is no different. We must remind ourselves to look for new opportunity instead of being blinded by the dark side. And I think the Baltic Sea region is well positioned for this, but we need to act fast in order to hit the unique uh, window of opportunity for the Baltic Nordic to maintain our leading role in the energy and climate transition towards a low, carp low carbon society. We need to make knowledge-based decisions, as we also just heard from the previous speakers, in order to choose the right pathway. And this is where you come in. And I think it's so great to look around at all the posters, to hear the previous speakers uh, this morning, to see uh, all the, the research projects in this program, how they have created useful knowledge uh, for and, uh, and, and cooperation within some of the political priorities, as you also heard from, from uh, the previous speakers just before. If you just give you an example, um, the latest the consideration for energy security in the region led to the my Marine Board Declaration, which is, uh, by other things, encouraged explore, to explore joint cross-border renewable energy projects and identify infrastructure needed in the Baltic Sea. As an example of relevant research project in our program that support this declaration, I would like to mention the interconnection of Baltic Sea countries via offshore energy hubs, the one that Hardy, he was sitting there, that presented this morning. It's a good example that we actually do something that is really uh, useful for, for political discussion. And likewise, if you look around, all of them are, are uh, doing something that is actually political demanded. So, so this is a unique situation. And I think our joint program is building on, on this and also on the close cooperation of the funding parties. Um, and it all adds value to the National Research Initiative. I'm almost done. And it enables us to ensure that it's a political demand-driven research program that are relevant for the de development of the Baltic Sea region. This is something that we, from my side, from Nordic Energy Research side, uh, is very pleased of and would like to support in the future too. So I sincerely hope that we will see a strong prolongation I can't even pronounce it, of the program. So with these words, thank you and enjoy the cat. <laughs> hardly have answered it, but I will still ask it. Uh, okay. Why is Baltic Nordic research cooperation important? A little bit philosophical, actually, question. Okay, so you've, been giving, uh, you've been given a couple of interviews to Latvian media, so you've probably been asked something, something, something no, similar. No, actually, not this one. Not this one. No, anyway, I think you can have a lot of technical answers for this one. <laughs> but the most important, I think, is that we are, are, are thinking alike. We, we have a common trust in you know, other, like we are more in family that, that, than, than many others are. And, and that makes that, that facilitate the cooperation that we dare to stand on, on each other's shoulders. 
and then our differences is actually what they make the cooperation strong. So this is what I will, I will say uh, is the most important thing. Thanks. So we will now have a small panel. So I invite all the previous speakers up here to take a place by the microphones. Yeah, so I, I will start out with, with a question and then uh, leave the floor open to questions from, from the auditorium. Uh, I mean, you have basically touched upon this question already, but I, I will still ask it. Uh, well, now in front of, uh, I don't know how many you are, 40, 50 uh, uh, Nordic Baltic researchers in the room. Uh, what could they do to make your job easier as a policy implementer? You've touched upon it already, but is there anything you would like to stress in particular? Uh, Dimitri. Yeah, thank you. Testing? All right. Well, I'm glad that you asked that question for two reasons. First and foremost, it would allow us to elaborate on the role of the researchers, and secondly, to provide a more concise uh, insight, I'm called an answer, an insight into what policymakers are expecting. So the role of the researcher is pivotal in terms of defining what job needs to be done. So there are statisticians, there are analysts, there are, let's say, more or less uh, cross-disciplinary people who are able to deliver results. So first and foremost, uh, each of uh, researchers, academia staff, uh, sc or scholars should clearly define, well, on a personal level, what role had been undertaken by that respective person within the confound of the program. And uh, well, heading into the second part of, uh, of my answer, I would say that transparency and a lack of bias uh, with a person or, or academic would greatly help because policymakers are always subjected to political pressure, which is biased in itself. So mm -hmm. uh, let's say a top-down uh, clear dialogue would always be much more helpful than an agenda-driven interaction, which is to say I had seldom seen over the last five years here within the country. So kudos to everyone who does their job. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Anything that you would like to add, Daumantas? Testing now. Okay. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I did actually uh, cover this in presentation. I think, uh, well, to make our job um, easier, the advice, I just uh, stressed it there because we, we at the ministry are not the ones who know everything. Uh, that's, I'm ready to say this and really need advice from the research part. We uh, work with the planning. We work with uh, you know, um, ambitious targets, but uh, what about the achievability? It's something we really, uh, really hope from the community. And now we have not stressed this that much maybe like four years ago, but now it's when this program goes on and we also reflect on, on, on how it goes on. It's, it's really something that helps us a lot as an energy ministry. Of course, yeah, I think the other, another answer would go from uh, like science ministry, but from us as energy, the ones who, who, you know, who deal with everyday energy issues, this is the most important, I guess. Okay, thank you. Iria? As a head of uh, strategic planning in energy department, uh, I would say that it, it is not a question about making easier anything, but it's um, making possible at all, because the strategic planning is working with future topics and the science is ahead of uh, policy making in the sense of the, all the innovation comes from there. So there, therefore I see that this is impossible to work, work without, uh, without the scientific background mm. at all, mm. at least in my job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Klaus, you want to add something? I can add a little bit, of, although uh, we are not implementing uh, policy uh, from my side, but, but what we do is we facilitate the knowledge creation, and I think this is the most important thing, and you're doing an excellent job, and just keep on doing that. The important thing for us is that we actually get a 
common knowledge bases that can make can be the foundation for the right political decision. And for that, we need you to share your knowledge. We need you to, to make sure that everybody in the room actually know what you're doing. So, so this is our, our, our uh, yeah, wish mm -hmm. that uh, we have some more of this. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, any questions from the audience here, on what, from what you heard? Uh, well, okay, Anna, I think, was, and then uh, Dagnia, yeah. <laughs> Together with my supervisor, yes, yeah. we said to ask questions. So, uh, actually, we have a long discussion about that we need to have cooperation between researchers and ministries. And my four year experience within this program showed that we had uh, different steering committees, meetings, and very close contact with. Ministry from Estonia and Ministry from Lithuania, frankly speaking, yes, so we got feedback and I know uh, Daumantas and Didier long years already, yes, but uh, from, from Latvia, it is always different people. Do What is your practice? Who is, uh, because uh, for Estonia and for Lithuania, I know this contact point at least, at least yes, who, who is responsible, so, but in Ministry of Latvia, do you have some special contact point or some responsible who is responsible for this program and for contacting and uh, for, for this point for cooperation? Well, that's a technical Almost. question and I do believe that uh, each and every researcher values stability and funding the most. And from that standing point, it's of course always uh, a nice to have in terms of overall conjunction of any type of uh, physical, online, or other official or unofficial interaction, a fixed pool of people who you work with. Yet within the Latvian case, there are two issues. One is systemic and one is uh, of uh, HR nature. So the systemic issue is that uh, people rotate within the civil service. It is a common practice to change affiliations on a ministerial level, which, uh, well, on one hand, may pose a little bit of an inconvenience to external parties, yet that facilitates a turnaround of ideas and a lack of stagnation, much, as, much in line with what the European Commission is doing within their services. I mean, you, you see an average chef de division uh, being rotated each and every five years. So that's, uh, from that standing point, I do believe that there are no issues there. It's just a practice of a country and you need to be acquainted with these specificities, so to speak. And the HR issue is very simple. Uh, young people coming into the civil servants tend to be ambitious. They tend to try different areas. And that's a horizontal change of planning. So I wouldn't advise any researcher to hope that on the Latvian side, they'll have the same person as their focal contact point for the next 50 years. I mean, that's implausible. So it's a dynamic environment. And this is why, well, I personally and most of my colleagues enjoy working there. Okay, and maybe I just will yeah. continue, yes, uh, to Klaus just question, because we, we uh, know how we transfer our knowledges and results to our ministries, to Baltic ministries. And, uh, but uh, this final point in Nordic, it would be Nordic Energy Research, this organization. But uh, how these results, uh, which are interesting for, for Nordic countries too, how they transfer to Nordic ministries? Do you have this? this Connection. Good question, Klaus. Uh, yeah. we, we do we do have the connection. If they will take them on, I I don't, I don't know. It's up for them to decide. But what we do is we 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 publish it at our website, and we this is one thing. Just to start a point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess you're not, not convinced yet. <laughs> but what we also do is we actually help uh, giving input to the ministerial meetings, uh, both Nordic ministerial meetings and also the uh, NP8 meetings in, in Tallinn uh, and later this, this month, no, next month. Uh, so, so what we do is we put input to it and, and uh, uh, we put some, some papers, discussion paper in advance that is based on the research that has been conducted both on, in this program and in the Nordic programs. So we, we do use it and we are well pleased about all the input we get. So, so you use it? We, we do use it, for okay. sure. Next was uh, Dagnia Wonberga, please. I have two questions to 
Uh, uh, my first question is to representatives from Baltic uh, min uh, ministries, and the uh, question is about uh, Tommy Linder's presentation. Very nice presentation with very nice results. How, how you will use those results uh, uh, for, uh, in, uh, in, in the plans of uh, climate and energy uh, plan 2030, or you will not use that? And second question is, um, is it possible to arrange some uh, energy society to, to hear and to understand about those results and to inform about that, what is done in Nordic Energy Research Program in this project? And, uh, and we have a representative from Nordic Council uh, office, and maybe it is possible to do. Is it possible that you could answer what Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia will do on that? Okay, two questions. Who would like to start from the Baltic side on how uh, the result of, of uh, one of the uh, um, research uh, of, of Tommy Lindros, I think, yeah. Well, I may begin, uh, if no one minds, of course. I do believe that the first question uh, was the easiest one of the two. Uh, the results shall be used, uh, as it has been officially stated, for the review of the National Energy and Climate Plan in the next year. Uh, by 2023-ish, we should have a uh, plausible framework of quantified uh, metrics, which will form the basis of setting uh, energy and climate goals, as well as emission reduction goals on both a sectorial and a pan-economic level. And that will be done uh, and by, via a standard process of acquiring the results, seeing how the models work, having a discussion at the National Energy and Climate Council, which is the official go-to format to adopt formal decisions, and then the plan shall be adopted by the Cabinet of Ministers and bring forward the European Commission for further evaluation. Regarding the publicity side of affairs or these communal disseminations of information, I would say that, first and foremost, the format we are enjoying today is one of the most plausible ways to go up and about it. I would like to see a conference like this to become a yearly, an annual format in which updates may be delivered, exchange of ideas commenced, and most importantly, researchers, policy makers, and I would go so far as to say business representatives, may put their heads together in stating and seeing what is going on, which direction things are heading, and how we go up and about it. So if we could pinpoint one single activity, I would say this is the format, the go-to format, in order to establish a less formal and more practice-based dissemination of the results of your work. Uh, Damantas, you want to add something? Yeah, thank you for the question. So about the first one, I've been using it. So yes, of course, it will be used. I have also showed it in my presentation. So from technical side, first of all, we need to read it through because I also agree it's a very good job done, but we haven't read it completely through because we have just received the results. And in our case, at least, we will use it for the two main strategic documents in energy for us. It's the National Energy Strategy Renewal and the National Energy and Climate Plan, which was all mentioned here. So it's due to the, to the next year, but yes, so they will be used. Uh, and about the second question, I don't think I'll add something very much more. It's, as a minimum, these results will be published, as, as Klaus has, has mentioned. And if, if, if anything like this event is needed in the future, I think it's, it's possible to organize and to, to like to update on, on, on the results. So as in general, I would be in favor of that if needed. Uh, Iria, if you want to add something. Um, yes, in Estonia, how we use uh, uh, the results of the Tommy's uh, scenarios. We have uh, several pathways for our electricity system. Um, and uh, I can use it uh, for validation of the results first. And uh, second, we have internally, our energy sector is very active and they have their own pathway already, so they believe in it. So whatever we, we produce also, at the end, probably companies are the, the in, this, in this sense, uh, most important that they will, they will do the real actions. So 
we, we should use this dissemination in the, in the, for example, in our uh, working groups, what are currently held for uh, energy sectoral plan until 2035. Uh, next uh, working groups are already in the December, so we can use the results and we are looking there with our uh, uh, sector representatives through all the different scenarios and uh, discussing uh, wh what would be the best for Estonia. And of course we use our uh, unofficial platform energiatalgut.ee where we uh, put our uh, surveys and uh, pathways and uh, this is the place where how I call it, is it as a, our uh, brain <laughs> in energy, so there we make the synthesis. Thank you. Uh, Klaus, do you want to say something about further dissemination of results? I, I could do that. Yeah. So, so the way we also use it is not only about this, that, as I just mentioned before, that we use it for, for uh, knowledge-based uh, political discussion paper, but we also use it to identify new research gaps, what is, what is needed to, to be the challenge for tomorrow. Uh, because we can see that what is, is actually solved now and what, what is, uh, is, is needed. When we come to about this uh, dissemination or, or social activities, I'll just echo uh, the others. One of the, the things with this conference today it was that it was actually meant to be, as you also mentioned in your speak, was meant to be, be held already two years ago. Uh, so, and I hope for the future we will have, hold it, uh, keep making this kind of conference more uh, regularly so we actually do it. What we also normally do when we get a resource is that then when we go out and are co-organizing at different events, it can be democratic festivals, it can be at the uh, climate uh, summit in, in a cup or wherever we go, we also often invite experts and where, where we know that they have done a good job and then normally we take them from a project. So it's also uh, one of the issues that we actually help you promote your results in, in, in these different kind of uh, events. Maybe you can say something. Uh, I know that our, our colleagues in, in Tallinn, uh, 10th and 11th of uh, November, uh, talking about conferences, are, are arranging uh, an energy conference, uh, not specifically on energy research, but on energy in general, where I assume you also will be involved? But the 11th of, of November is the NP8 uh, meeting, it's the ministerial meeting. So, so okay, it's, so you're it's, not it's involved in close. it. I'm, we are involved in it. You uh, are involved in still, in and delivering maybe uh, also Iria yeah. and uh, her colleagues, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's not open for public in that, in that respect, sorry. Okay. We have time for uh, one more question. Thank you, Juha Kiviloma, VTT Finland. So, assuming we would have more of these uh, scenario policy support uh, projects going on in the future, in that case, what would be your preferred way of engaging? I, I know you're busy people and, and the other people in the ministries are busy. Uh, would it be something like steering committees or uh, weekly calls even, or, or even a direct participation in the modeling activities by some of your staff or or would it be more like workshops workshops executive summaries or even youtube videos that you would prefer to 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 get the information and to participate in the research process itself oh there are a lot of options there what would you prefer <laughs> Okay, we'll let Dimitri go first. Well, this is a matter of personal preferences, really, but uh, if there was any upside to the pandemic is, that, is the fact that uh, most professionals got acquainted with uh, remote means of engagement. So from that standing point, I do believe that weekly or bi-weekly meeting formats may be shifted to the digital realm. I mean, it saves time, it saves effort and resources. So this, uh, yet, uh, I do see a need for a more or less frequent uh, establishment of um, steering committee meetings. I mean, a on a quarterly basis or a biannual basis uh, would be the preferred course of action in order to sort of step back, eyeball and pinpoint all the issues or any other type of uh, intermediary results generated, have a throughout discussion in person, and then, well, return to the drawing board. That would be my personal way of doing things, and I do believe that each and every ministry, as of each and every public policy uh, 
well, administrator, let's call things what they are, as well as each and every research institution, would adhere to a bilaterally agreed form of engagement. So this is my take on the matter, but I do believe that uh, perhaps uh, some of my colleagues would have a different opinion. So let's hear them. Yeah, Dalmantas, you agree? Yes, I agree. Thank you for so many options, actually. All of them are you know, acceptable. Maybe the, this uh, um, uh, internet one is quicker in a way than the meeting meetings, but uh, as you speak and you ask from the, on behalf of VTT about this uh, modeling project, so um, when we do read it, it through, all of it, so we, we might get some questions. I uh, hope you won't mind if we just send contact you and in one of the ways you, you <laughs> suggested, maybe video call or something, we could you know, have a discussion, so if, if you don't mind. We'll find a way, I think it's a technical question, but yeah, we're happy to cooperate. Thank you. And lastly, Iria, before we go for a coffee break, yes, please. Yes, if there is any specific questions or something needed to be discussed, the easiest is just to uh, quick Teams meeting uh, to agree the time and uh, let's see through what we have in Estonia. We have a lot of different pathways and just to find, uh, well, as I said, validation of your results and our results. That, uh, all the other ways as well, but uh, but if you need sp specific things to discuss, we are open just to find time, and uh, it could give uh, both sides. <laughs> Thank you. All right, it's incredible how punctual we are. If there is no really urgent question, I think you can. Well, there's one more, a short one. I, I will try as far as I can. Okay, let's have a last short question then. This is Engineer Khaled Zaran speaking from Egypt. I'm working on behalf of the Ministry of El Petroleum in Egypt. It's my honor to be here with this uh, best networking. I have lots of questions for each specific, but I will uh, do it later. But I have a general question for all of you and the people of the Nordic and Baltic. Where, uh, what about the, uh, the security of supply for this kind of energy in a sp uh, uh, taking into consideration the uh, uh, geopolitical uh, situation that is uh, going in these days, uh, specifically speaking between Ukraine and Russia. And the second uh, question is, uh, is there uh, any possibility of uh, interconnecting between your country as a Baltic and the other European uh, parts? It sounds like you are zones, the Baltic and the Nordic, and the South European and the Eastern uh, and uh, uh, the, the Western. Uh, and, and this question is uh, also uh, trying to, to go beyond this area to the MENA region. What's your plan? What are you expecting from the MENA region, specifically for Klaus regarding the uh, hydrogen and the ammonia? You didn't speak any more about the uh, uh, energy transition and carbon neutrality uh, Blends. Uh, I, I, I might say that you, ha you have to have like a matter of dynamic uh, strategies, not a, 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 a business as usual strategy. You have to, to, to go dynamic way with uh, this geopolitical situation everywhere. Thank you. I'm sorry for, uh, for this long. Thank you. Very relevant, important question. Definitely. I don't know. We, we will try to dive into it and give some short reactions. I don't think we will answer them all, but we'll try. Well, not to break the tradition, I'll start first again. Uh, <laughs> in order to answer both of these questions, and they're both worthy of a PhD thesis, hands down, uh, it would take me about two and a half hours each, as I like to talk. Mm -hmm. Yet, in order to not keep uh, um, esteemed colleagues from uh, the much... Uh, uh, anticipated coffee break, I'll just provide you two short bullet points on each one, and then we may uh, engage in bilateral fashion. So, security of supply. For the Latvian case, the elephant is the room, is the absence of uh, Russian natural gas delivering uh, possibilities, not capabilities, but possibilities. So, we are diversifying our uh, supply chain, we are engaging quite proactively. Um, I would say, producers and stakeholders within the region, within the broader European Union, North America, and uh, the uh, Arabian Peninsula. So this is uh, what we're doing, and I may elaborate you know, on a bilateral fashion 
later. In terms of the blending, in terms of having a plan B and C, that is of course in place. And I would say that plan C in this regard is marked as a governmental secret, so I won't be able to brief you on that. But plan B is to have a transitional course which mixes in carbon capture and storage together with alternative natural gas supplies. So this is, in a very, very tiny nutshell, what is going on, and we may converse further. Uh, any short additions from the other panelists? Yeah, thank you for the question. So energy security, about our first question. Yeah, of course, it is an important topic here. It may seem that we speak only about decarbonization, maybe, but in a sense, it's also about security in, in, in energy, because in Lithuanian case, for example, it's a very low level of our own electricity generation, and we need to increase it. And it's also connected then with uh, green sources, so, so to say. So yes, it is an important topic. Maybe it's, as, as they say, maybe it was not very explicitly a project on security, but it's a, an issue tackled through, through other, uh, other topics you, you see from this four years of, of our program. And, and you asked about a connection, uh, maybe it was uh, like the European light connection. You mentioned hydrogen, so yes, uh, in this term, Hydrogen was also not very specifically mentioned as a topic for you know, for uh, for research, but yes, we are, in our country are giving it ever increasing attention. Again, especially from green sources, how to how to produce it, and we do participate in the so-called European uh, well, project. You can say so, like hydrogen backbone, which maps in the future how these you know, connections could be made. Uh, EU-wide for hydrogen to be transported. So yes, we are part in it, but maybe not in this margins of this, so far not in the margins of this uh, cooperation. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Iria? Yes, uh, from Estonia side, uh, what is connected to natural gas, uh, the current uh, winter we really hope to have enough storage in our southern <laughs> neighbors at Latvia, we have this natural gas storage. And we have also preparedness to take LNG trip. So I, I hope this uh, makes good. But in longer run, we are running. Uh, we initiated the project uh, for uh, gas network uh, decarbonization uh, with uh, with Finland, Latvia, and Lithuania. So we are working for for the scenarios there and for for the action plan. But we have prepared already climate-neutral electricity generation pathways and action plans, and as well we have similar action plans for heating and cooling. So we have covered now all sectors, and in, in addition, energy efficiency, we have just started a, a big uh, project uh, financed by European Commission to find out uh, the best uh, and optimal ways. And I don't know how dynamic these action plans will be, but at least we have the idea how to reach the, the climate neutrality. Thank you. Any final comment from Klaus on this? A very small comment. Yeah. With respect to security of supply, you can split it in two. You can have what is needed to be taken action right now and what is needed to be taken action in the years to come. When you talk about what is needed to be taken action right now is more a political issue. How we deal with that is, is that, as I said before, we are facilitating some intergovernmental uh, uh, working groups, uh, actually, for example, the Nordic Electricity Market Group, looking at the EU repowering plan or the EU toolbox for, for security of supply in, in this uh, uh, matter. And they come up with, with Nordic standpoint uh, that is uh, implementing either the EU or is implemented in the Nordic countries. With respect to more long-term perspective, we, we do look at, at this, but it's, it's also to deploy all the technologies that we have heard about today with, with efficient district heating or with, with uh, uh, different kind of, of renewable energy, uh, energy hubs in the office or etc. When it comes to this uh, north-south that you, you mentioned, what we are always looking for is to, to find the right way to, to use the the small money we have. We have to meet, need to have uh, the largest impact we can have. And what we really want to do is to select Baltic Nordic uh, solution that can, can help global challenges. So this is what we are gaining for, so we can benefit both the society, the industry, 
the university and so on. So, so it's, it's not an easy task, but that's what, what we do. So we really would like to, to collaborate with the South as well. But we would like, of course, to support the, the Baltic Nordic solution that is actually uh, useful out there. <clears throat> with respect to, to hydrogen and ammonia, uh, as mentioned in, in my talk also, we have a research program only on, on hydrogen, uh, actually, uh, and we have one on, on maritime transport where ammonia is, is one of the the potential e-fuels to, to decarbonize the maritime fleet. Uh, and we are making big progress because as a region, uh, the Nordic have the world's largest maritime fleet in the world. So we are very much focused on ammonia uh, in, in the Nordics. So, so we do a lot of this, but we don't have any uh, specific results. But it is on our agenda, and it's going to be for the next decade at least. Thank you, Klaus. You get the last word. Now we go on break. We meet again about 10 past 3. But before that, I think we will say thank you to the speakers and, and uh, panelists.
ladies and gentlemen, I can see you are engaged in conversations. That's very good. Uh, but we need to continue with our program. We still have a couple of <laughs> presentations. <laughs> yes, you're first. <laughs> no, you're not first, by the not way. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's true. So if uh, the audience please takes their places. We are starting again. I feel bad about breaking up these conversations that you're having, but there will be more opportunities to, to talk tonight, for instance. Um, we are almost on schedule, um, and we will continue with a second video greeting this time from the Lithuanian Vice Minister of Energy, Daiva Garbaleuskaite. Hope I pronounced it more or less correct. Dear Baltic and Nordic partners, dear colleagues, allow me on behalf of the Ministry of Energy of the Republic of Lithuania to greet you in your conclusive gathering after the program's four years in action. You represent the community that this program has formed, community of ministries, other funding bodies, energy researchers and students. Every one of you has played a part in energy research projects that have been financed by this program. As Ministry of Energy is responsible for energy policy, policy suggestions from the projects are especially important to us. We are thankful for the results uh, from uh, the already completed projects. These consist of topics such as uh, decarbonization, future of uh, district heating, future energy technologies, energy sufficiency, and near zero emission buildings. Their recommendations will definitely be considered in our energy policy planning. Our ideas for future uh, energy cooperation around the Baltic Sea stem from uh, recent Marienburg uh, declarations signed at uh, Marienburg in Copenhagen on the 30th of August uh, uh, this year by heads of states and uh, energy ministers. Together with the other European Union countries surrounding the Baltic Sea, we are ready to respond to Russian aggression in the field of energy. Lithuania understands the necessity to phase out dependency on Russian fuel, fossil fuels as soon as possible while contributing to climate neutrality in the EU. Coming back to Baltic Nordic region, the Baltic Sea holds substantial renewable energy resources which can accelerate this effort through electrification, increasing alternative fuels, diversifying and decarbonizing gas networks, increased sector integration and a green hydrogen economy. Development of adequate power generation capacities, stronger grids and interconnections alongside a well-functioning internal energy market will increase our resilience and energy security. The Marienburg declarations uh, show that energy objectives in our region are both immediate and long-term up to 2050s and onwards. As an example, the potential uh, for offshore wind power in the Baltic Sea Basin reaches up to 93 gigawatt. But the current set of combined ambitions for offshore wind in the Baltic Sea region is around 20 gigawatt by 2030s. How to properly address those ambitions? That is where research becomes especially important. The Marienburg Declaration revealed that ever-increasing need of cooperation among the Baltic Nordic countries around the Baltic Sea. Energy security, decarbonization and renewables are headlines, while special attention is given to offshore wind and green hydrogen. These topics also hint towards further common energy research results. 
Therefore, we are ready to support the prolongation of Joint Baltic Nordic Energy Research Program centered around clearly defined science for policy research topics among partners. We believe that sharing the results and knowledge for projects and activities among ourselves brings ever bigger value. Let me wish you a successful conference. Thank you, Achu, Madam Minister. Uh, we continue with two more presentations, uh, and I'd like to invite again Dr. Anna Volkova. You are a key person in this program. Yeah, uh, Professor and Head of Smart District Heating Research Group, Taltech, please. The floor is yours again. Again, me. <laughs> and um, I'm Professor Anna Volkova from Department of Energy Technology from Tal University of Technology. And uh, now I would like to, to, to speak about uh, this program, Joint Baltic Nordic Energy Research Program as incentive for the development of innovative or for novel energy topics of high importance in the Baltic Nordic region. And uh, in the very beginning, I just would like to tell about my role, why maybe I'm so uh, I have presentations and discussion and so on. So actually, during last four years, I participate in five projects uh, of uh, of these programs. So I have experience as the only um, of project leader, and we were the only team working on this heat pump potential in the Baltic states. And uh, I participated in another ordered uh, research about this cooperation. Uh, cooperation in clean energy technologies as an invited expert and I'm project consortium leader in uh, f uh, regarding fifth generation district heating and cooling and I'm partner in two ongoing projects led by my colleagues from Riga Technical University and about nuance project Andra Bloomberg will be next and tell a little bit in details about this project so actually I have experience in uh, in variable types of research activities, only not in mobility these time, yes, but actually in variable types and in variable roles. That's why I came, can maybe compare uh, uh, how cooperation was going on, what may be advantages and disadvantages of different forms of, of projects. And I would like to share, maybe if I am too critical, I would like to underline, it is my personal opinion, yes, but maybe it can be taken into account. So uh, I just, uh, f from the, f I was absolutely sure that we have a very active participation from the Baltic state that most of uh, energy related research organization, are, they participate and maybe not so active from Nordic countries. It was my just internal feeling. But then I came to web page of this program and actually if we take joint research project so from Estonia it would be only Taltec who who is participating in different departments for sure and not Tartu University for example yes and yes I know that there is a University of Applied Science but I understand it is mobility program for, for them and Latvia it will be Riga Technical University and Green Liberty as partner and in Lithuania, it would be researchers from Kaunas. It will be Lithuanian Energy Institute and Kaunas University. So maybe implementation of other research organization can be a aim for, for next. Uh, it would be our com competitors, but it would be maybe more honest and more, more wider, wider picture you will get in, in the result. But uh, Nordic countries are represented by variable, uh, by different organizations, rather rather large amount, but we have Finland, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden represented in, in, in these projects. And uh, now I would like to compare two types of projects and uh, five minutes, I have 14 minutes. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was promised for me, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, a little bit long, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> yes. So actually, uh, actually, uh, it was two types of projects, and uh, uh, Daumantas uh, mentioned yes and uh, described. So it was one group of projects. It is previously ordered projects, 
about heat pump potential cooperation and about transport. And uh, before projects, it was absolutely predefined topic, clear goal, work packages defined by ministries. It was competition usually, as I understand, yes, it, uh, and usually it was one partner, one company per project. During project, it is rather short project times. I have participated in two, and it was only six months. Very regular meetings with steering committee on each stage, on draft stage, on, and uh, due to these, it was feedback, draft reports, commands, updates, so very, very close cooperation during all the project. And, um, but as I told, usually representative from one Baltic state, or so from one Nordic state, so no co cooperation absolutely um, uh, between or among research organizations from different Baltic states. And after project, usually it is clear, published, publicly available results in the form of report. You could see printed out version. In some cases, more than planned. In our case, it was this available map that was not planned, but during project we published it. And for sure, results can be used by other program projects, and uh, usually there is no scientific papers based on, on it, not in our case we published, but usually no, and uh, very active result dissemination, at least I can, I can see. But uh, if we take joint research projects, so before project, usually it is only fields that we have, that are identified, and here with green I mentioned that are covered, I'm not right because transport has been covered a little bit, but not specific projects still are available. Yes, so, but, uh, but fields were defined and covered by some of projects. Rather active competition, I, I calculated two, five per one, and I was correct. And in these, in this uh, type of project, usually researchers over, offer their novel ideas. And I got feedback from ministries that uh, ministries and authorities, in some cases, they don't know what can be novel and so on, and researchers would be the people who would offer something that maybe ministries before would not thinking about. And they offer topics where their competence is very strong, and it is for sure big advantages. A longer project time, usually two years, a limited or no meeting with steering committee, at least our, our experience showed it, and I understand during discussion in some projects there were, but actually very, very minimal, and uh, there, there were no. Uh, but it was possible cooperation and active, uh, active contribution from the side of researchers. In other workshops, what we have two times per year, but it is mostly by initiative of researchers. So it is their choice if they wish or not. It is not obligatory. Uh, for sure, we have many presentations during international scientific meetings and conferences and so on. So dissemination in scientific community, for sure. In this case, we have it and uh, scientific papers and very active cooperation among research organizations in the Baltic and Nordic region. And after projects, published scientific papers, partly published results, because I understand you have two weeks ago, you have got some results, but I tried, I'm sorry, I tried to find very clear reports. I did not find. Maybe some additional information will follow from Kevin, but it was, uh, yes, and uh, so, uh, but results, if we have it, there are models, some models and some presentation can be used by other program projects, uh, can be used by ministries and other authorities in case there are clear res results, yes, in case we, they will have some reports or something, I don't know, partly we will have it now, yes. Uh, no so active result dissemination, maybe we will have it, <laughs> yes. But uh, consortium, a very good consortium that can be used for further projects, for further pr applications. So I imagine myself as Baltic Ministry and think what can be benefits of this. Uh, maybe I'm not correct. So for sure, uh, for joint Baltic, re this research project. So for sure, novel areas are develop developed because they are offered by researchers. Uh, ministries get financial support of researchers in their country, but we should remember that each ministry pays for it, yeah? that's why 
question how many they go give, get back. I don't know this financial side, but but yet, yeah, but they get this uh, through this program, finance, uh, financial support. Uh, for sure, the knowledge transfer from Nordic region to the Baltic states and in energy sector, and sometimes it is really useful and we need it. Possibility to compare with other Baltic states, always interesting and important for all us <laughs> historically. And uh, possible to request additional information from experts and researchers, but uh, it depends on ministry and on communication between researchers and ministries in each country. And active participation in other research, because due to this uh, program, you will get better expertise. Expertise grows during this project implementation. You have your personal, not personal, but in your country, better experts. And maybe suggestion. So yes, I'm like girl who offered to make a test for for whole group, <laughs> but uh, in class and no one likes her. But uh, maybe it should be some somewhere that we have obligatory prepared fact sheets and recommendations for national ministries, with country specific, maybe in national language too. We have to have some common position for the Baltic and maybe Nordic region in some cases as the result of each project. Uh, possibility more specific topics or these themes or fields should be defined by the Baltic ministries, what they really need. And now there were many answers maybe. <laughs> yes, and uh, maybe additional these specific or tenders, uh, these specific uh, reports half year, maybe this form would work in some cases better. And uh, possibility to add condition that all three Baltic states should be represented in one project proposal because they are not the case for all projects. In some case we have Lithuanians and Latvians, or in some cases without Latvians. And one suggestion from my experience from International Energy Agency, District Heating and Cooling Platform, something like an expert panel, maybe provided by Nordic countries, maybe once per year, but it would be very valuable for each project just to get some opinion from the site, yes? Firstly, regarding uh, for the Nordic region, <laughs> I imagine myself as Nordic region, so for sure, again, novel areas are developed, financial support of your researchers, the knowledge transfer from the Baltic states to the Nordic region. In some cases, it is really going on in, in some fields. In some cases, common understanding for the Baltic Nordic region, uh, identification of the common points of interest in the Baltic Nordic region, and uh, what else? Promotion, promotion of Nordic energy research and uh, Baltic Nordic region in the world. And new consortiums, new cooperation networks that will, uh, that will lead to, to new projects and new investments and financing. And very shortly, just example of our, of our projects. So we had all Baltic states involved. We had novel topic high level of expertise in district heating topic from the Baltic states. Maybe here we had partly transferred to Nordic region too. A research focused on the Baltic region. In the very beginning, we hoped for Baltic Nordic region, but due to lack of data and too many differences, we focused on our three countries. And here, a panel of experts would be very helpful. We did not have it, but maybe next projects will, will have it. And uh, we have policy recommendations too, that uh, fifth generation district heat and cooling will not replace fourth generation district heat and cooling. And these concepts should be developed in parallel. Uh, only new buildings area should be introduced with this concept and uh, uh, this technology will promote um, integration of renewable energy sources and existing tariffs, mechanisms and business models will not support, uh, not, don't support this concept. And for sure, using of ultra low and low temperature waste heat should be investigated more. And we will provide to our ministries updated map as a tool, updated map with three new types of ultra low heat sources simulation model and hope for report. But it is our initiative. We decide to make it how we make it. So such comments, hope not too critical. Please, if you have questions or later. Yes. Thank you very much.
presenting uh, your views and suggestions based on your uh, experience of the program. Uh, I think I'll leave the floor open if there are any questions or comments or comments on uh, Anna's presentation. Uh, we will have a later as well, uh, yeah, but if there's anything immediate you want to react to, you have a chance. If not, we will continue then with the, uh, the next uh, uh, and last uh, presentation uh, by uh, Ms. Andra Blomberga, professor at Riga Technical University. Started uh, her professional career uh, as an energy auditor in a pulp and paper factory. Uh, later joined ABB Latvia, uh, where she started ventilation department. Since 2006, she has worked as professor at Riga Technical University, focusing mainly on research concerning energy efficiency in buildings, studies of complex dynamic systems with system dynamic models. She loves British detective series, gardening and Argentinian tango. The floor is yours, Sandra. <laughs> So, yeah. um, so I would like you to spend, uh, let's say, three seconds on thinking who do you think is a hard to reach energy consumer? What kind of person you imagine? Just, just think. Maybe you know somebody. Probably you know somebody. Maybe you are a hard to reach energy consumer yourself. So uh, we have a project. Uh, the short name is Nuance. And the idea for the project, I would say it's a demand-driven project. So these are the people who work on everyday basis uh, with uh, uh, renovation of multi-apartment buildings in Latvia. This is where the idea comes from. And the specifics of the sector is that in Latvia, both in Latvia and Estonia, apartments are owned by single owners. So if, if you have to do any renovation, you need a 51% uh, agreement of 51% of apartment owners have to agree to do something together. Imagine an average building, 100 flats. So 51 person, strangers normally, should agree to take a loan for the next 20 years. Uh, and the trick is that it's extremely difficult to move these energy efficiency projects. And we talk about energy savings in residential sector now. Uh, and uh, we were wondering who are these people who are not letting these things happen. And there is always, when there is a meeting in the multi-apartment building to discuss energy efficiency projects, there is always somebody who is managing to stop the project at the very beginning or maybe later stage. And only few projects uh, uh, are really implemented. So we applied for the project. And we have, a, you see, we have a Rig Technical University, me and my colleague. Uh, then we have from Sweden, uh, K K KTH. Then we have Anna again. And uh, we have Oslo University, who is not listed yet, and I will show you why, but uh, she will join us later. So we decided to take a look. And the other word, but which is important here, is multidisciplinary. So uh, it's, uh, we have uh, energy modelers on the team, we have environmental engineers, thermal engineers, and we have a cognitive psychologist. Unfortunately, he had a seminar uh, on uh, teaching uh, in schools today and he didn't come yet, but, but he is a very important person in this uh, very technical uh, team. No, I will. So the goal of the project is to identify who are these hard to reach energy consumers and uh, uh, in, in this case, we defined they are easy, either uh, hard to reach physically, either they might be underserved, or hard to engage and motivate for climate impact reduction uh, behavior and change. So we, are, we, are, we, will, we, we actually are hoping to find out who are these people and how to engage them uh, to uh, boost up uh, Im implementation of national climate and energy goals. So what we've done so far is uh, we did the first work package. So we identified who are these people. And now let's take a quick look on who, who these people are. Uh, so, and we asked a research question. What are the main characteristics and features of hard to reach energy users uh, and how we can describe these people? 
So we uh, did the classification by country. Uh, we did qualitative and quantitative analysis of groups uh, by country. We use different methodologies, and you will see later it's either literature review or and communication with stakeholders. And uh, <clears throat> when we wrote an application, we were discussing, uh, are we going to, to look on the commercial sector as well, but finally we stick to residential consumers, and uh, we looked on uh, thermal energy, heating or cooling, and power as well. So let's take a look on Estonia. Uh, you, you Estonians might consider now who are these people in Estonia. What do you think who these people will be, at least? But the uh, honest team has found is that, so they uh, basically did literature review, they do, did stakeholders interviews and uh, questionnaires. And uh, the target uh, sector are multifamily buildings uh, uh, and uh, thermal energy consumption is the uh, main interest. Uh, uh, so Anna's team did uh, uh, communication with a number of stakeholders, so they interviewed uh, energy companies, and the energy companies uh, thought that it, these hard-to-reach energy consumers are located geographically far. Uh, uh, they are weak apartment associations. They thought that the uh, share of these hard-to-reach consumers is less than 10%, and uh, uh, motivation uh, can, can be coming, could be coming from obligations and legislation. Uh, financial institutions just mentioned that uh, the interest in energy efficiency financing is high. Municipalities have seen hard to reach energy consumers and you can see that they think it's uh, about 5%. Real estate developers have never met any hard to reach energy consumers. And uh, the, the, the main focus was on apartment owners associations and uh, these associations uh, um, mentioned uh, elderly people, low-income families, uh, families with lang uh, language barrier and low education level. So uh, there are three groups identified in Estonia, elderly, low-income, and low education level uh, uh, households. Now let's go to Sweden. Our Swedish colleagues now can think what are the hard-to-reach energy consumers in Sweden. Uh, 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 Swedish partners did literature review, and the target audience is uh, different, and it's because of the house, uh, residential sector, how the structure, how the resi residential sector uh, is, uh, is made up in uh, Sweden. So it's electricity consumption in the households. I don't have much time to, inv uh, to, to give details on this, but there is a description by our Swedish partners that they basically look on the households that consume more than 10,000 kilowatt hours per year uh, for uh, heating needs. Uh, so uh, they, this, they defined uh, as hard to reach energy consumers in Sweden elderly, high income, and rural and low income families. So there is a difference that in Sweden there is high uh, income households are the ones that are really hard, uh, hard to reach. And now look, let's look on Latvia again. Latvians can think. Who do you think are these uh, people? So we used the uh, literature review. We did mass media analysis and uh, we did the uh, stakeholders interviews. Those were energy efficiency experts dealing with building renovation, energy consultants, energy service companies, municipalities and energy companies. And the same as in Estonia, we looked on multifamily buildings and uh, thermal energy uh, consumption. Uh, the interviews we had were a bit different from uh, Swe our Swedish and uh, Estonian partners. Uh, and uh, so we had, um, we, we tried to get more, really more uh, the, the in-depth information. So uh, the experts estimated that it could be 5 to 10 percent from the total number of apartment owners, hard to reach energy consumers, and you can so see the distribution. So they are hard to reach physically, and these are mainly Latvians who just own apartments and they emigrate uh, somewhere else and just have a, a property. Uh, then they are underserved and uh, basically energy companies and uh, house housing companies uh, are not paying at enough attention to these people. And then you see the last group 
uh, are hard to engage or motivate. And uh, what uh, we found out during the interviews that uh, these hard to reach energy consumers have a, a significant in impact on the group dynamics uh, during the decision making uh, when the renovation project should be accepted. Uh, when I told this, 51% is needed. So what kind of uh, uh, consumers we identified during the interviews? So first group is physically hard to reach. Uh, as I said, uh, people who are not living in Latvia but owning the property, uh, underserved, uh, people with low income, and then they are uh, a very different group from Sweden and uh, uh, Estonia. So it's, we call them, and uh, not us, but the experts mainly call it, I know better. So it's one kind of uh, personal personality. Then there is a personality called I'm against anything. Then there is a disappointed and openly aggressive person. Then there could be indifferent and silent roarer and saboteur. So, and these groups are basically defined by all experts and they call it different ways. And those who are familiar with uh, environmental policy and, uh, you know, uh, like renewable sources, there are big movements against, let's say, wind farms. You know, there are these nimbists and bananas people and cave people. So you can distinguish between these uh, uh, types uh, as well, these bananas and uh, NIMBY people. So uh, we decided to eliminate a few of them uh, because like phys physically hard to reach. Uh, they are not hard to reach uh, in the sense that they are against energy efficiency. They are very much uh, for energy efficiency. So uh, we eliminated these groups and we finally decided to stick to four, four of them. I know it better. I'm against anything disappointed and openly aggressive and silent roarer. Uh, so conclusions from the first results, just to sum, sum it up. Uh, so we looked, we identified different groups uh, in the household sector in Sweden. It's electricity consumers, and in Estonia and Latvia, it's heating consumers in the multifamily buildings. And just to sum it up, uh, you see the, the different groups that I just uh, mentioned. And now we quickly look uh, what are the next steps and what we are planning to do in our further research. Uh, the main goal of the project was to understand what are the, uh, what drives these people? What, are, what, what, what drives their behavior? So we have a cognitive psychologist in our team and he's currently developing a final version of the questionnaire and the interviews. And uh, we are uh, aiming to develop, it's called mental model. So this is what you have in your head. And these are the questions that uh, will be asked, the main questions about uh, how the energy bill is made up. We interview, and after the interview, we make uh, separate mental models for uh, each person interviewed. And this is an example from Sweden. They already have done some homework ahead of time. And this is a mental model of energy expert. And this is a mental model of, uh, I think it was the wealthy, wealthy home, ho household. And then we will do an exercise comparing mental models and to understand where is the gap of knowledge, whether there is any gap, maybe there's something else behind uh, the behavior. And once we will do it, uh, then we will uh, extrapolate the findings to, to, to look on a future net zero energy system design. And this is where our colleague from uh, University of Oslo will join us. And uh, yeah, and uh, expected result uh, from this activity will be that we will prepare recommendations for policy makers. Uh, who are these people and how to uh, tackle them by different policy measures. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, and uh, our Norwegian colleague uh, will uh, do the energy modeling for uh, both Baltic and Nordic to see the impact of these hard to reach energy consumers on uh, future net zero energy system design. Thank you. Any immediate questions to this very interesting study, I would say? Yes, please, one question. Yeah, it's coming, it's coming soon, yeah. 
Thank you, Edith. Thank you, Dr. Andre. Uh, in fact, I had been uh, before in, in an, um, let me say, energy codes and standard project in uh, my country that was sponsor, uh, sponsored by the United Nations Development Program. In fact, I, I am, I'm, I'm wondering, you are speaking about a project in the year 2022, uh, uh, like to, you are looking for the heart rich groups, and uh, I'm quite sure that you already have in the Baltic region or even in the Nordic, you have lots of codes and the standard regarding the building sector. And you know everything, and you know uh, from the, uh, for example, the um, uh, utility companies, you know every bill that go from here and there. So uh, it sounds for my brain or for my understanding that this is a, a, a project that should have been done 20 years ago, not today. Uh, it, it sounds like uh, you already have your own codes and the standard. There is no people that hard to reach. You have uh, every data in everywhere. It sounds like uh, you can go inside the heart of the people, like the Chinese people did all these things. So I'm, I'm still wondering, is it a project and you're still thinking about this in this time uh, and you already have those kinds of codes and standards? In fact, I'm not contradicting, I'm just trying to configure the situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, any quick comments? Yes, a uh, quick answer. <laughs> if there were an answer on uh, who, how to tackle hard to reach energy consumer, we wouldn't be talking about climate change today. Hmm. There is climate change still going on, and the reason is a human behavior. Hmm. And that's it. The, the, the climate change is driven by human behavior. Okay, short, clear answer. Let's go uh, <laughs> ahead to the last, I think, section, and I will now give the floor back to, to Kevin. In, in his safe hands. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Stefan. We will be moving on to the plenum discussion for session two. So we would like to invite back Irie, Mitris, Domantas, Klaus, Anna, and Andra to the seats. We are, uh, we don't have enough microphones, so I'll have to be standing here for this session. But uh, in this session as well, we will be open for questions from the audience, and we hope to get uh, a lot of questions from you as well. But we will start with a question, what is your takeaway from what you have heard today? Uh, and since you started this tradition, Dimitris, maybe you could start again in this session. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, some traditions are easily made and uh, seldom broken, so let's keep it that way. Uh, on a more uh, concise note, I do believe that today's event was quite multifactorial in terms of the trigger points actually activated in terms of the thinking process. To put it in a, another wording, uh, we all have our individual ways of thinking and our individual, uh, let's say, paradigms of reaching conclusions. So each and every one of today's participants would, of course, walk away with his or her own takeaway. Yet, uh, on a personal level, I would say that the main acknowledgement from today's event uh, in so holisticity and a marvelous event it was, to be honest, I would like to say that uh, this particular day would, in my personal, again, memory, uh, go down as a cooperative effort uh, which is aimed at reducing the barriers between policymakers, researchers, and the general populace. So uh, on a broader scale, the main discussion which took place today was how do we reach the right conclusions and how do we establish a framework 
which would enable us to progress towards the destination, which is not only deemed to be the bright and shiny, decarbonized future, but actually gets us there in an inclusive, robust, and efficient pattern, in a fashion which 20 years down the line would, would enable all of us to look back and say, that was the breaking point, that was the right time for a right decision, which was actually made. There are not many events or not many time periods in history which are as turbulent as the last three years. I do believe that uh, we are still in for quite some time of disparity and, in a sense, uh, unclarity. Yet each and every calamity passes. So today's takeaway is that there is hope, but there must be work conducted, and that work must be science-based. Thank you. Anna? It is always not so easy to continue after Dmitry's great speech. But uh, for me, it was, as in the beginning, I have told that it is, it was, it is real pleasure to participate here and to meet, as I, as I answered in my interview, to meet uh, representatives of different projects. And really, uh, this conference can be considered as dissemination of activities. So we already, I have seen, especially not maybe during sessions, but during coffee breaks, when different, uh, already consortiums start, new consortiums start uh, uh, to be organized, and uh, many discussion between researchers and national ministries already starting, starting during during coffee breaks too but uh, uh, actually uh, during today conference we we try find these uh, common points of interest and I hope already there are some some directions where we have to make more efforts and I think it is real useful and uh, I agree that uh, maybe annual conference would be good solution and we'll have we'll meet after one year maybe in Tallinn this. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> in the short uh, term, tomorrow we have board meeting. So for for the board meeting, I think we had the best uh, best preparation from today <laughs> than ever. So we have a lot of input for that. Uh, so was also these keywords for the what were asked by you. <laughs> so to have the conclusions. And uh, second, of course, uh, I will organize an internal meeting in Estonia to discuss the results and um, so as soon as possible, we will go, go on with this uh, work. Thank you. Yes, Andra, what is your takeaway from what you have heard today? Uh, takeaway is, uh, <clears throat> I would say, um, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, when I answered to the question, climate change is going on, and it's going much faster than scientists, scientists were expecting. So I would say we don't have much time left to, to really start doing things. And I would expect uh, politicians getting some of the things that we talked today on, on like real, real uh, legislation, doing real, real things uh, from what scientists are warning. And uh, this is what I expect, that it's this time from, uh, from scientists to the legislation, it's as short as possible. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm thinking to myself, I think I have stressed policy advice too much today because I got enough of it. <laughs> too much even for one day and uh, I'll definitely need the presentation copies to remember everything and to come, come bring back home. But uh, yeah, apart from that, what I personally find that every each of the projects which, which I here presented and that way I explained um, Live, so to say, they were all interesting, all relevant. They assess different angles of energy. Um, yeah, and I think, of course, we I didn't know the names of the projects, but and general idea. But when they are presented lively, it's it's, it's another another thing, and it's really the research managers and uh, colleagues researchers who deal with these projects are really able to explain what they are doing and what they have achieved. So I think we should should uh, continue such an activity in some in, in, in some some period of time. So yeah, thank you. And Klaus. 
So, so I might just echo most of the other speakers here. Um, being in the, the uh, energy crisis that we are now, I think it's, it's more important than ever that we actually join forces and, and, and stand together. And I think this uh, conference actually showed that this is what we, we have uh, obtained. And, and it's really nice to see the energy level between all of you being involved, even Anna asking if we're using the results. So this way of, of uh, open up for further collaboration is, is really great. Uh, and, and I think that what, what really matters that we can see that, that, that you are engaged, that, that you actually want this, and we want it. So, so we have some common interest, and I, I really hope that we will continue this. As I also said in my uh, beginning, uh, in the welcome speech, this is also about creating uh, collaborations, uh, creating friendships that have a long-lasting effect. And I think when I see you at the coffee breaks or the discussion here with your uh, enthusiasms, I'm sure that we have created that. And I'm very proud of it, and I think you should be proud of, of being part of it. So thank you for that. Anyone in the audience that would like to ask some questions? Um, I, I think that I'm disturbing you with my questions. But I have a, a nice discussion with Demetrius in the break uh, regarding what, is, uh, what will be the role of the European uh, Union and the Baltic and the Nordic people uh, in the upcoming COP27 that will be held in Egypt next month, inshallah, God willing. Thank you. Would you like to respond, uh, Dimitris? I think the question was to you. This is a question for the political level, actually. This is uh, something which is emanating directly from both the political consensus and the lack of thereof in certain areas. So uh, being a humble civil servant uh, and a modest one, I would not be in a position to actually fill you in on the details. But. Uh, I think that deductively we may conclude that uh, energy reconfiguration, climate change, and, uh, well, uh, the elephant in the room, the absence of Russian deliveries of fossil fuels to the global market would uh, pave the day. This is my assessment. This is not the official part of the program or the agenda or any other type of documentally recorded, uh, let's say, information. This is my personal take on the matter, but again, this is purely a uh, let's say, uh, intellectual exercise and nothing else. Klaus? Uh, also on, on the COP, what we do from the Nordic Council of Ministers is that we, we have created a common stand down there representing all the Nordic countries. So we, we, we actually stand uh, united uh, and actually promote the Nordic sh solution that can, can help uh, the climate change around the world. So, so we, we, we are there, we are present, we have people uh, going down there talking about hydrogen, about uh, energy security, about yeah, uh, diversity and, and other things. I'm not sure anyone in the audience or in the panel would be able to, to respond to that. Ilya? Yes, uh, we have strategy Estonia to 2035 where it is said that we should become climate neutral. And all the climate uh, change and uh, mitigation and adaptation issues are under the Ministry of Environment uh, at the Climate uh, Department. And as far my latest uh, information I have that the Minister of Environment will, will be there. And uh, the Climate Department, they always go there. So they are away like weeks <laughs> and it's hard to communicate with them. So they are there from Estonia. Are there any other questions from the audience here? Excuse me, just, uh, yeah. just I would like to say from Lithuanian's uh, side, actually it's very, very uh, common as in Estonia's case because uh, of course the country will be represented in COP, but it's the Minister of Environment that will be there. 
Ministry of Energy, as of today, it will not participate. But generally, yes, as, you know, as part of the European Union country, we also form a common position there. And uh, we help, you know, uh, I won't, I can't go into specifics, but yeah, we will be there and as a as a reunion. I can also say that we at Nordic Energy Research are hoping to or planning for having an event regarding energy uh, cooperation around the Baltic Sea as well in the Nordic Pavilion uh, on the 15th of November in COP as well. Yeah. One of the other prog questions that we have prepared here is uh, what would you say have been kind of the best thing that has been working with the program for the four year that has been, has been going on? Our traditions are lively and alive. So, uh, on a uh, again unofficial basis, uh, each and every person from the ministry, uh, well, the Ministry of Economics, that is, uh, had enjoyed their participation and the uh, ability. Or, or the possibility, I should say, to engage with elaborate scholars and to actually have met your team, Kevin. I do believe that we've established a partnership which goes well beyond the uh, framework of the program, and that is value in itself. Uh, on a formal basis, um, I would be complied to say that the results generated were valuable, both from an analytical and a policy-making perspective. So, uh, from a very um, linear uh, let's say, standing point, we got what we wanted, uh, to put it in a very blunt fashion. But of course, things are more complex than that. As I said, our partnership uh, had blossomed and grown, and the fruits have been born. But that doesn't mean that the tree must now be left somewhere uh, on the sideways uh, of history. I do believe that this is only the beginning. I do hope there will be a continuation of our cooperation, and I'm very much looking forward to it. I will speak from the side of researchers and one of the main tasks was cooperation among researchers and uh, Baltic states traditionally we have really good cooperation experience but this, uh, this program gave real platform some on regular basis to, uh, to make it stronger, to develop it and uh, to add uh, Nordic countries in our family this time. Uh, representatives and uh, it was it was really successful and uh, uh, for sure maybe uh, the budget of project was rather rather limited but uh, rather clear conditions and maybe not so long term so it uh, allowed us to 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 develop maybe not so in, in so detailed way as in large, huge horizon project, but as prelim preliminary research, but in really variable topics can, could be covered by this program. <laughs> yeah, internal cooperation for sure, but I think that that I hope that there, uh, there will be such a future that, uh, that we can mm, map kind of uh, Baltic Sea area future together at the end that we have several pieces of puzzles now but maybe we can make something out of it that it uh, will stay not the single pieces but but let's hope that we are strong enough and, uh, and we'll continue with the process. Yeah, I'm new to this program. I have not much comments on the last four years. Uh, but I, what I would advise uh, to think my fellow uh, colleagues, researchers, to consider to become science-based activists. So this is one of the ways how to disseminate the information and the knowledge that you have, not just leaving it somewhere on the shelf or in a computer, but go out and talk to people about what you have found and how this can be used. And believe me, even though you might think that this is boring to general public, who, who, who might care of this? I, I can tell you from my own experience, it works and people listen, and people listen to scientists and researchers because they think that we know what we talk about and we, are, and we can be trusted. So I invite you to become a science-based activist.
Uh, I think the general answer would be that the program worked for the Minister of Energy of Lithuania. It was actually an experiment for us, uh, such a program, because before, before that we didn't have any such kind of activity, you know, like being part of the research board and uh, dealing with research projects, this is new for us, so I think it, it worked. The results speak for themselves, and uh, we, we were also impressed by the number of competition in, in, in in uh, research projects, uh, as we, I remember we had some tough dis discussions sometimes on, on choosing. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so I think the general answer is that it's, it, it, uh, well, it worked. And uh, it's, we are also value, as from our perspective, the cooperation of the Baltic partners and Nordic partners in, in this, and we have the common region, with energy common uh, energy uh, issues in, around the Baltic Sea, so I think it's a very, very rewarding uh, experience. I think we, we could, we, we hope for it, for it to continue. Yeah, I would just want to echo this, uh, that it works. When, when I compare with what we else is, is involved in, like a large uh, EU project and so on, this program has shown to be very flexible. It has been uh, maybe not easy to, to, to implement, but at least it has impl been implemented quite uh, nicely with a good management both from our colleague and, and from the ministries. So, so I say that, that this is much more flexible and I also hope you who have gained, uh, uh, got the, the finance for your project also find that it's, it's uh, a flexible way of, of doing it compared to the big projects. So it works. I just want to say that as well. Any questions? <laughs> question in the back there as well. Yeah, Michael Jorgensen, Aalborg University, Denmark. I think now we've heard mostly about how the Baltic countries can, can use the program. So maybe those of us from the Nordic countries, sorry not to kind of say that we're not together, everybody, but uh, how can we use the, the experiences? I would say from, from our side that we have enjoyed quite a lot to be able to combine, let's say, Danish uh, social science with Baltic uh, social science and a modeling experience uh, and, and has been quite fruitful to uh, also sometimes compare different research traditions and different types of data sources and, 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 and so on. So I really hope that, that that can be continued and that also there can be possibilities for funding some spin-off from some of the, the projects, uh, either bigger projects or smaller parts that can be spin-off from, from earlier projects. Maybe not a question, but a reflection. That was reflection. more a comment than a question, but I, I can build on that uh, comment and ask the, the panel because we were talking a lot, as you said, about the Baltic countries and Baltic cooperation. So what can a program do to strengthen the intra-Nordic collaboration? Do, the, do anyone in the panel have, have any thoughts on that question? And I'm looking a bit at uh, Klaus here. <laughs> it's actually very similar. It's, it's, it's about collaboration. It's about uh, getting the, the... What you also mentioned as, as a remark, as I heard it, that you actually gain some, some new collaboration partners, partnerships that were not there uh, five, four years ago. So, so this is the most Im important thing. And I think you can use it either to, to create new uh, projects within the Nordic, or if you're going abroad to, to apply for EU funding or whatever, then you actually have uh, the basic for a new foundation already. Or if you, you want to use it for national funding as, as well. So I think this is what you mostly gain uh, from each other, but of course also, even though we, we face uh, similar challenges, we do have uh, differences in, in our countries. So hopefully you also learn from each other challenges so you don't have to do the same mistakes or experience uh, that your neighboring country di did. So, so, so a broad answer, but uh, I hope you can use it. Thank you. Any other questions? And I think we... <laughs> One last question. Go. Thank you. Uh, from, for, uh, this time I'm, I, I would like to speak about the nexus, food, water and energy. What, uh, what are you uh, planning for these 
uh, Nexus, especially you have lots of challenges in terms of food and water scarcity, like in terms of the road, like the, at London or, or, or at uh, England. And also we have some challenges in terms of energy. So what are your thoughts, planning, insights in this term? Thank you. So uh, I must admit that uh, our region is a little bit different from those, mm, let's say, countries or those uh, people who are more or less engaged in a um, sub-Mediterranean uh, cycle of both water distribution and accumulation. So uh, to put that into perspective, when the uh, central and southern Europe uh, was suffering the drought uh, this summer, which actually generated a huge amount of macroeconomic losses and also cost some lives, uh, the Baltic and the general Scandinavian region uh, had not seen a turbulence of that magnitude. Yes, the temperatures were way above average uh, and the water levels in rivers dropped, which subsequently uh, kind of manifested a energy generation issue. Yet uh, disposable water for both drinking purposes, hygiene, and uh, even crop watering, uh, that was all present. So from that perspective, I do not see a embedded risk uh, in the short term. Now, if climate change really escalates and we will see an average increase in temperature above one and a half uh, Celsius degrees per annum, that may change. Yet, uh, at the current standing, there is no acute water shortage in the region. That brings us to the second issue, the issue of uh, food security and food supply. Well, uh, most Nordic countries are more or less sufficient in terms of providing basic uh, food commodities for the populace, uh, being, you know, Latvia, Norway, or Denmark. So from that standing point, the hunger issues here are not emanating from a physical lack of capacities or products. Now, those are more uh, of uh, a, let's say, macroeconomic and social inequality dimensions manifesting themselves in an ugly manner. So uh, from that perspective, the nexus which you mentioned uh, kind of circulates around energy, energy security and supply. So the main issue for uh, the Baltics, less so for Scandinavians, but still, uh, is that uh, in case we may not find alternative and sustainable solutions to ensuring a uh, long-term positive dynamic of uh, energy generation, which is both climate neutral, uh, net zero emitting, and uh, aching, let's call it that, let's put it that way, to a notion of further decarbonization vis-a-vis -vis other regions within the European Union, then that would pose a problem which will manifest itself in higher energy prices. Now, higher energy prices will result in businesses while closing down, uh, supply chains breaking up, and from that standing point, of course, there may be microeconomic turbulence. Uh, even now, uh, the most European governments, uh, be it again Germany, Luxembourg, Latvia, uh, had issued certain amount of subsidies to households and businesses uh, on a non-state aid supportive basis, but on, on a general scale, on a horizontal notion of redistributing funds which have been accumulated over the last two years uh, for one reason and one reason alone, to prevent supply chains from breaking down and in order to support households and businesses uh, in terms of their further operations and survivability. So from that standing point, I do believe that decarbonized renewables based uh, both electricity and heating, which are the main goals here in the Baltic systems of uh, both supply and demand equilibration, would amount to additional investments within the grid, and that would also generate jobs in specific sectors. So in order to put it into a broader perspective, our main issue is the energy sector at the current standing and in the short term. We need to transit to another paradigm of development which should be sustainable and net zero emitting. And that is the main underlying goal of all public policy here within the region uh, which has been conducted over the last 12 months. And if we solve that, if we solve that, we will both contribute to 
uh, battling or combating climate change on a global basis, and that will generate positive externalities and spillover effects into other regions where droughts are acute and uh, food is in short physical supply, and that would be our contribution to global peace and security. So thank you. Would any one of you like to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, we we, we um, have this climate adaptation. We solve this at the moment is in this way that thanks to financial support by Norway, uh, Luxembourg and Iceland, we, we have uh, half of our local governments, they have in the pro uh, process of preparing energy and climate plans where they also solve these issues and show, show actions how, how to be prepared for the, for the uh, crisis and risks. So, we hope that this is for the beginning enough. And in this year, we had a workshop, uh, workshops for local governments on, on climate uh, change and climate adaption and uh, energy management issues where local governments were pretty active. So we have quite uh, going in, in the very on the place, on the spot where really happens things and we have been discussing with the people from the local governments that what are their problems and how the state, uh, from the state the point of view, we can help them to solve them. So we work on this issue with, together with the Ministry of Environment where the Climate uh, uh, Department is, uh, is uh, responsible on energy, uh, on climate adaptation. Mm -hmm. And you demand us? It's just a short intervention from me. I would like to support colleagues and Dimitris. I think it's very well explained why well, about this uh, food, uh, water, energy uh, nexus because yeah, energy was really the most uh, pressing issue now here. But I think it's all is well explained, so I will not go into <laughs> details. And I think we might uh, conclude the panel discussion. So give them all an applause. And then you will each get a chocolate from, from Ditte. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ditte, you can tell him that we have a Let's see if this works. So, uh, we are a bit ahead of schedule, but I think that's, uh, that's not a problem if we end a little bit early. Um, but before that, I would like to say a few words on the future of this uh, program. Uh, and as you all know, or most of you know, there are some projects that are going to be working for the, last two, for the next two and three years. More specifically, one of the mobility projects will conclude first in 2024. And that's what's planned of the funding that we have at the moment. Uh, but as you've heard from the discussions, we are in a dialogue with the different uh, ministries on a prolongation or more correctly, a new memorandum of understanding uh, where we would like to continue this type of, uh, of research cooperation. Uh, when we were planning this conference, we were hoping that this could have been uh, concluded today, uh, but things take time. Uh, and we have a board meeting tomorrow uh, where we will discuss this in more detail. Um, and hopefully we will, at least from Nordic Energy Research side, where we have a positive board decision from our side that we would like to continue this cooperation, we would like to see a continuation of this program within the, before the end of this year. But as uh, mentioned, things take time, things need to be done properly, uh, so we, we, we still need to see how things play out. Uh, and with that, I would like to invite uh, Stefan here to mm -hmm. close the conference. And I can see that he has already yeah. taken I'm, I'm his chocolate. I'm not going to uh, try to summarize uh, uh, <laughs> this conference. Uh, I just actually want to say two things. The first is thank you. Paul Diaz, Aita, Achu, or Tak. 
as we say in Swedish, to everyone, uh, to all the participants, uh, especially for all the presenters, of course, also to colleagues from uh, Nordic Energy Research that have come here uh, uh, to arrange this uh, seminar. Also thanks to my colleagues that have helped from my office, helped out, and uh, also to the technical service for arranging uh, uh, the technical part of, of this conference. Uh, it's been really worthwhile, I think, to, and rewarding to, uh, to be here, for me at least. I hope you, you feel the same. I've learned a lot listening to your experience about uh, 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 cooperation, Nordic-Baltic or Baltic-Nordic, whatever we say, I think we mean the same thing. Uh, the second thing I want to say is there is still a dinner waiting for you. Um, it will take place at 7 o'clock in a restaurant called The White House. I don't know if it has a, a Latvian name. Uh, um, Probably not, but it's, it's situated in the park, Vermanes Parks, just stone throw from here. You can see one corner of the park. So uh, you are all welcome there at 7 o'clock for the dinner. Okay? That's all. So thank you once again. Yeah, okay. Yeah.